Hi, and welcome back to my channel for another Christmas romance. Join these two lovebirds as they seek to give Christmas and the spirit of Christmas to those who need it most. And who knows, maybe by the end, you'll have a Christmas project in mind too. I'm wishing you a very Merry Christmas this year and a Happy New Year. Without further ado, The Great Christmas Contest. Chapter 1 Christmas was kind of a big deal around three French Hens department store. Unlike many high-end stores in the big city, French Hens, as it was lovingly referred to by employees and patrons alike, maintained a Christmas department all year long. However, in mid-October, the small section on the third floor exploded to transform French Hens into the epitome of Christmas shopping in New York City. The cream-colored granite tile walkways were buffed and polished to the highest shine. Boughs of holly and sprigs of mistletoe hung from arches. Fresh greenery was draped across every surface, the pine needles dropping on a daily basis, much to the frustration of the janitorial staff. Red, gold, and silver bows were aplenty, and the melody of holiday classics pumped through the sound system with cheer. With December officially upon them, the whole city wanted to experience Christmas at French hens, and the store was crowded from open to close. The owner, a mysterious personage who preferred to remain out of the spotlight, insisted that French hens be a place where Christmas cheer could be found, not just in the decorations or merchandise, but on the faces of the employees as well. Samantha Noel did her best to follow all of the company's policies. Her skirts covered her legs to her knees. She was always on time, and she never took longer than the allotted 30-minute lunch break. However, maintaining a look of Christmas joy was something she was not able to do when dear Mrs. Woolbridge, the woman who had trained Samantha when she'd started at French Hens, appeared to be having a heart attack. Hang in there, Mrs. Woolbridge. Samantha rubbed the back of the elderly woman's soft hands in an effort to keep her conscious as she lay dazed on the industrial carpet. Across from Samantha, Christian Malone took Mrs. Woolbridge's pulse. His phone lay on the floor by his knee a stopwatch running on the screen. A shock of dark hair fell over his forehead, just begging to be tucked back in place. Keep talking to her, he said, lifting his chin and giving her one of those million-dollar smiles that made ladies want to buy whatever he pointed to on the rack. There was no question why he was the top sales associate in the women's department. He often told her she'd do better selling suits to men than dresses to women, if she would flirt a little. But there was something about flirting with married men, even to make a sale, that bothered her like a disorganized sales rack. As fun as Christian was to look at, she often thought that he cared more about his commission than he did about how the women actually felt in the clothing. Store security hovered above the two of them with their backs turned. They kept the crowd of concerned and curious customers out of the way and watched for the paramedics. Hopefully they'd get there soon. Mrs. Woolbridge's eyes rolled back in her head and she moaned. Can't you do something? Samantha moved to rubbing Mrs. Woolbridge's arms and brushing her wiry gray hair off her forehead, noting the perspiration along her hairline. He yanked a stack of sweaters off the stand behind him and stuffed them under Mrs. Woolbridge's legs. I don't have a med kit. He copied her movements on the other arm. I should be a doctor, he mumbled. Out of the way. The crowd and security guards parted and a group of emergency responders circled around. Christian jumped out of the way, but Samantha was reluctant to let go of Mrs. Woolbridge. Her husband had died two years ago and her children and grandchildren were sprinkled across the country, rarely calling and never visiting. To ease the loneliness, she'd often invited Samantha and or Christian out to dinner after their day shift so she'd have company. There were others from the store on the invitation rotation as well, and French hens was her family. Tears gathered. There were so many people who would miss this woman if she couldn't work anymore. Is she going to be all right? Samantha asked the nearest paramedic, a stout blonde with a severe ponytail and gray roots. Christian grabbed Samantha by the shoulders and hauled her to her feet without giving the woman a chance to respond. Let them work. They need space. But. He wrapped his arms around her from behind, not as a cage but as a comfort, resting his head on her shoulder. Normally, Samantha would never allow such familiarity, but her emotions were in turmoil. Besides, Christian hadn't hesitated to catch Mrs. Woolbridge when she went limp. He was fond of her, often teasing her into giggles. He even called her grams. He might just need someone to hold on to right now. 
And since his arms were strong and sure, it was much too easy to justify letting him hold her. Mrs. Woolbridge came to again just as they were lifting her onto the gurney. She waved feebly at Samantha and Christian as they hauled her off. Mr. Takashiro, the store manager, elbowed his way to Mrs. Woolbridge's side. He spoke rapidly and then leaned over the bed to hear her response. Security walked ahead and behind them, making sure people dispersed and assuring shoppers that everything was taken care of. Samantha shivered and snuggled deeper into Christian's hold. He tightened his arms around her. Are you okay? His breath was warm on her neck and brought to mind an evening of hot chocolate, fuzzy socks, and a warm fire. She shook off the image. I won't be okay until I know Mrs. Woolbridge is okay. Steve and T. Roy from the men's department across the walkway eyed her and Christian with curiosity. Reluctantly, Samantha stepped out of his consoling embrace. The December chill raced up her arms, leaving goose bumps in its wake. Christian's frown only lasted as long as it took a customer to ask him to check the price on a fitted jacket. He brightened like a Christmas tree when the lights were flipped on, and he ushered her towards the business clothing display. Samantha sighed as she watched him make an easy sell by complimenting the way the cranberry jacket warmed the woman's skin and how the charcoal gave her a professional edge. No doubt she'd think of him each time she put them on. Her phone beeped and she checked it quickly. Dad, you're out of bread and milk and peanut butter. Merry Christmas to me. Samantha rubbed a throbbing ache over her right eye that always accompanied her father's visits. He wasn't supposed to be in town this year, having opted to follow his twenty-something girlfriend to warmer climates. Bunny or Bridget or Beth or whatever her name was must have discovered that Dad wasn't as wealthy as he claimed and sent him packing. Hence, he was raiding Samantha's kitchen for lunch. Welcome home for the holidays. She sent the text with a sigh. Their manager, Mr. Takashiro, came charging through the area, his mustache twitching. Samantha did an about face, hugging her phone to her stomach in hopes that he hadn't seen her texting while on the sales floor. She couldn't afford to get fired, not now. Instead of standing there and waiting to see if he had caught her, she charged toward the fragrance department. Hey, Samantha, did you hear about Mrs. Woolbridge? Asked Dree from behind the perfume counter. She swiped the glass cleaning cloth in circles without watching what she was doing. Her short, dishwater blonde hair bounced off her chin as she moved. I heard she died right here in the store. Samantha refrained from rolling her eyes. She didn't die. She passed out. Of course, in the rumor mill, passing out was the equivalent of standing at the pearly gates. Dree's hand went to her chest and she deflated. Thank goodness. Did you know she brought me a cupcake on my birthday? I didn't even know when her birthday was and she knew mine. Samantha nodded. Here's hoping she has many more so you can return the favor. Yeah. Dree stood a little taller. I'm going to email that prayer channel, you know, the My Heart channel that will pray for sick people and stuff, and give them her name as soon as I go on break. That's a great idea. Samantha continued her lap around the store. She had so much energy, so much adrenaline after the whole incident that she needed to move her legs. She swung her arms and decided Dree had the right idea. Mrs. Woolbridge needed all the prayers they could offer. While she was talking to the good Lord, she asked him to bless her to get through her dad's visit with patience. I'm not praying for patience, mind you, because I know you think patience is a muscle that needs to be worked to get stronger and I don't need a test of my endurance right now. I just want to make it through the holidays. Oh, and if you have a minute, help me not to think about Christian before I fall asleep tonight, okay? He's no good for me, and I should know better, please help me to know better. Chapter 2 Christian refolded the gray, cable-knit sweater with precision and placed it atop the stack. His hands were steady despite the fact that he'd had to give Mrs. Woolbridge CPR. The science behind his shaking hands was simple. During a fight-or-flight incident, the sympathetic nervous system goes into overdrive, releasing high levels of adrenaline and noradrenaline. The result is an elevated heart rate and blood pressure and rapid breathing. He'd experienced none of the symptoms of acute stress while working on Mrs. Woolbridge, which only served to deepen his desire to become a doctor. Had life turned out a little differently, he would be doing residency now instead of folding sweaters and smiling prettily for the ladies who came into French hens for cocktail dresses. He may not have experienced an elevated heart rate while taking care of the patient, but he had when holding Samantha close. The kindest woman he'd ever known, Samantha went out of her way to make life easier for those around her. She vacuumed every morning so Mrs. Woolbridge wouldn't have to wrestle with the heavy machine. 
she stayed late to make sure the register area was tidy for the next shift, and she always made sure customers got their points for purchases but treated them all as if they had loyalty cards. But his favorite thing about Samantha was that she hummed as she worked. He didn't even know if she knew she was doing it. But to hear her humming warmed his heart and brightened his darkest day. The few times the two of them had accompanied Mrs. Woolbridge to dinner were full of laughter and goodness. He saw enough heartache and pain on his weekends as a paramedic that he craved the feeling of peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Hey, Christian. Christian's shoulders arched at the voice that sounded like it had been dragged over a mile of loose gravel. He really hated that voice. Lucky. Lucky let out a low whistle. Those are some nice threads you got on there, kid. Christian forced his shoulders to lower even as his left cheek twitched in memory of the last time Lucky had paid him a visit. The day had been cold, colder than this one, and he'd just gotten home from his father's burial. At twenty, Christian had no idea his father had a gambling problem. Lucky knew, though, and so did Lucky's boss, and they wanted their money. Death was no reason to think out on a gambling debt. Their work clothes, better than any work clothes I ever worn. Lucky hooked his thumbs in the belt loops of his worn-in-the-knee pants. He may have been a gangster, but he wasn't the classy kind who wore Italian suits and fedoras. Lucky moved a wad of chewing tobacco from one cheek to the other and glanced around as if needing a place to spit. If he spit on French hen's floor, he'd be on the street in no time and angry at Christian for not sticking up for him. Already, Bert, one of their plainclothes security guards, circled the area, his eyes discreetly pinned on Lucky. I don't make the dress code. Christian shrugged. Did you need something? Lucky grinned. Nah, I just hadn't seen you in a while and wanted to touch base. I like my customers to know there's a face behind the mailbox, you know. Unfortunately, Christian did know. And he mailed payments two days early to make sure he didn't have to see Lucky's ugly mug. His prominent Italian nose took up most of his face, his dark eyes not even trying to compete for space. How he could see through the two slits of flesh was beyond Christian. But see he did. Thanks. You're welcome. Lucky slapped a meaty hand on Christian's back. You know, I'm thinking that if you can afford threads this nice, we're not asking enough out of you. What do you mean? I mean, fancy pants, your payment just went up 500 a month. He pounded Christian's back. Merry Christmas, my friend. He walked slowly backward. I'll be watching the mailbox for your letter. Christian's heart sank to the floor and he nodded mutely. There was no use arguing the payment amount. Lucky didn't care that he was barely getting by, that he'd already given everything, including the education fund his grandparents had left him before they died, just to get the payments down to a manageable level. Five hundred more a month would do him in. Not for the first time, Christian considered running away. Could Lucky's boss really find him in a small town in Montana? With computers and the internet, probably. One electrical bill in his name and Christian would be left out in a field somewhere to be eaten by wolves. He had to find a way to make that payment, even if it meant quitting his EMT job and finding something that paid more. He pushed the idea away. All he had was a high school diploma, his certification, and a mountain of debt he didn't accumulate. He was stuck and in desperate need of a Christmas miracle. Chapter 3 Samantha hugged her purse to her chest as she wove through street traffic to get to work. She wasn't normally a paranoid person who assumed the world was out to steal her hard-earned paycheck but one night with her dad had her hiding great-grandma's silver spoons and her mother's engagement ring. There was a reason mom left the ring in a safety deposit box for Samantha to claim when she turned 18. Her dad had sticky fingers. It wasn't that he was a thief, he never took from others. He was more of a raccoon who thought that if he needed something more than she did, it was his right to have it. At least he respected her physical space and didn't complain about her hot pink comforter with ruffles. Dad may be a lot of things, but Prissy was not one of them. Perhaps that was why these women, only a few years younger than Samantha herself, found him so attractive. He was the ultimate alpha male. That kind of man was great for dating, but he made a bad father for a little girl, which was exactly how Samantha felt at the moment, small and insignificant on the mean streets of New York. She merged into the revolving doors at French Hens and breathed in the fresh pine and cinnamon scent, a warm welcome on this cold winter day. Samantha. Mr. Torres hurried her way, his short legs working overtime to move him quickly before the store opened. His hand was in the air, as if hailing a cab, and his bald head reflected the fairy lights draped across the tiled path. Samantha put on her French hen smile and chirped, Morning. Good morning. Good morning. He stopped in front of her, pressed his palms together, 
and touched his fingers to his lips. We have quite a puzzle this morning. We do. Yes, yes. He jerked his head, indicating she should follow him. Samantha fell into step, shortening her stride to match his. He headed straight through the store to the back, where the employee's only sign separated the flashy storefront from the functional storage area. There was also a lunchroom, with white laminate tiles, gray tabletops, and white appliances that should have died a decade ago but continued to hum louder than a subway train. You have been asked to report to the upstairs office. The nature of the request was not made known to me, nor was the duration of your meeting. He stopped in front of the employee elevator and pressed the call button, rocking back on his heels as he did so. I trust you're happy working here. Of course. Samantha stared at him. Good. Good. Can you list three things that are going well on the sales floor? Samantha scrambled for a response. We have many happy, repeat customers, our area is always clean and inviting, and there's respect between co-workers. Lovely. Lovely. He bowed slightly. Have a good meeting, then. The elevator doors slid open and Mr. Torres hurried off. Samantha stepped inside and pressed the number four. First floor was men's and women's clothing. Second floor, children and teens. Third floor, appliances and furniture and the ever-present Christmas corner. She'd only ever been to the top floor once, and going up there now made her palms sweat. The same receptionist who had welcomed her for her job interview, a plump woman with thinning hair, smiled and motioned for her to go to the right. You're the last to arrive. Please head into the conference room and take a seat. Okay. Samantha swerved right and pushed open the ancient wooden door. The hinge creaked like it had been taken from Scrooge's dilapidated mansion. All eyes turned to her, and she resisted the urge to pat her loose braid to ensure her hurried walk to work hadn't ruffled things. Four people with French hens name tags sat at one end of the table, Christian among them. Samantha recognized two others from the children's department and knew the skinny, tall man came from furniture, but she couldn't remember their names. Next came Mr. Takashiro. He had mountains of paperwork stacked neatly in front of him and his no-frame glasses perched on the end of his nose. Behind the head of the table stood five people in red hoodies and jeans. They had a logo on the front of their jackets, but she didn't recognize it. Behind them hung five Santa suits in clear garment bags. At the head of the table sat Mrs. Woolbridge, looking quite pale and yet still fashionable in her red day suit. The tightness in her chest that had kept Samantha awake and in prayer on the woman's behalf released. She smiled, feeling like crying and laughing all at once to see her friend alive and well. She wiggled her fingers, not sure what the protocol was for hugging someone during a meeting. Please take a seat, Samantha dear. Samantha followed instructions. Something strange was going on, and her curiosity was piqued. Three French hens was known for pioneering Christmas movements, they'd been one of the first department stores to host Santa and Mrs. Claus. And, they were the first to have Santa hand out a candy cane treat. Samantha took the empty seat next to Christian, who winked hello. He should not be allowed to look that pretty and wink. Her heart dashed through the snow while the rest of her sat in the conference room and tried to retain a professional demeanor. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming. Mrs. Woolbridge's voice was stronger than she looked. I had quite the scare yesterday. I'm doing fine. But I have to make some changes. She leveled them with a look. That's where you all come in. Samantha sat up taller. Mrs. Woolbridge continued. My great-grandmother founded this store with two friends, a couple hundred dollars, and a love of Christmas. I am the last in the Woolbridge line, and I feel a great responsibility to ensure her vision remains strong for generations to come. She lifted her hands, which trembled slightly. But how do I choose a successor? I'm sorry. The beanpole from furniture lifted his hand. Successor. Mrs. Woolbridge chuckled. Yes, Miller. A successor. Someone who will run three French hens like I, my mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother have for over 125 years. Samantha blinked. She's the owner. But you work in women's, protested Chloe from the children's department. My dear, I've worked in every department, all my life. At times only taking one shift a week and others taking several. I've had such fun in women's this year that I found it was more enjoyable to be there than it was to be up here. She circled her finger through the air, indicating the upper management floor. Samantha cut a glance to Christian, her secret smile was reflected on his face. They loved Mrs. Woolbridge, each watching out for her in their own way. More than once, she'd caught Christian sending deep pocket shoppers to the older woman to make sure she had a decent commission check at the end of the month. Now that Samantha thought about it, Christian did things like that on the sly. 
He wasn't a showman out to boost his popularity rating, and yet she judged him because he often expressed his desire for bigger commissions. Maybe she should take another look at the guy. Mrs. Woolbridge continued, as I was lying on that hospital bed, I had a Christmas vision. Chloe narrowed her eyes. Miller's finger bounced on the tabletop. Mr. Takashiro sucked air in through his teeth. Samantha leaned forward at the same time Christian did. She smiled to herself and dropped her eyes to the tabletop, embarrassed that they were in sync and liking it at the same time. I've set up a new My Heart channel. She pointed to the back of the room and a projector sprang to life, illuminating the back wall with the same logo that was on the front of the matching red shirts worn by the group lining the wall. Christian read it for all of them. The Great Christmas Contest. Yes. Mrs. Woolbridge's eyes sparkled with mischief. Each of you will be given $5,000, which you must give away, the parameters will be explained shortly, before Christmas. These videographers will record your good deeds and post the videos to the channel. They'll also keep track of everything to make sure you're sticking to the rules. The one who performs in the tradition of three French hens, as I see it, will take my place. You mean we'll get the job of general manager? Asked Misha, the second woman from Children's. Her thick black hair was gathered into a band at the base of her neck. She quickly separated the hair into two pieces and tugged them, tightening the already impossibly tight ponytail. No, you'll become owner. There was a collective gasp. Samantha collapsed back into her chair. Owner. Owner. Of three French hens. This wasn't possible. But oh, if it was probable, she wanted a piece of that action. As owner, she could finally, finally move out of her dad's house and find a place of her own. She could stop trying to hide him from her friends, which she'd done since he'd seduced her once upon a time best friend Misty off to Europe for a romantic weekend, only to come home three months later tan, broke, and single. Wait, she could have friends. No one would look at her as the daughter of anybody, because she'd be the owner of something. Chloe pointed one long red nail at Samantha. But she's only, like, 22. How can she own a department store? 26, Samantha corrected. Oh, it's on, Chloe. If you think I'm too young to play, you need to get out of the sandbox before I stomp all over your castle, girlfriend. I was only 28 when I took over. Mrs. Woolbridge smiled fondly at Samantha. Age isn't a factor. Neither is race, creed, gender, religion, nor color. What's important is your love of Christmas and this store. She dusted her palms together. All right, now that I've done the introductions, I'm going home to rest. Mr. Takashiro will fill you in on the rest. Good luck to all of you, and may the spirit of Christmas guide your way. Everyone stood as Mrs. Woodbridge got to her feet. Samantha rounded the desk and wrapped her arms gently around her friend. She knew it looked like she was sucking up, but she wasn't, and Mrs. Woolbridge would know that too. When are you coming back to our department? Mrs. Woolbridge patted her arm. I'm not. I'm not as young as I used to be, and there are things I'd like to do before I'm too old to do them. Regret tugged Samantha's heart. If I'd known you would quit on us, I would have thrown you a party. Mrs. Woolbridge's crystal eyes twinkled. A Christmas party is all I want this year. Let's make it a good one, shall we? Samantha nodded mutely. The women's department would seem empty without the love Mrs. Woolbridge brought in every afternoon. Miller was right behind Samantha, ready to hug Mrs. Woolbridge. A small line formed, and Samantha went around the table to get back into her seat. Mrs. Woolbridge took a moment at the door to meet each employee's eyes and nod goodbye. This was harder than watching her be wheeled away semi-conscious yesterday. Yesterday she'd hoped Mrs. Woolbridge would get better and be back so she could make her a packet of gourmet hot cocoa for their break. This time, goodbye felt much more final. They all stood around, watching the door swing shut behind the classiest owner of a department store they'd ever known. When it was clear she wasn't going to jump back in and yell just kidding, they all slouched in their seats. Funny how none of us knew who she was all this time, said Misha. Mr. Takashiro slid a single sheet in front of them. And now that you know, you must sign here, indicating that you will not tell anyone. He muttered something about doing things in order and signing before the revelation. Samantha glanced over the sheet and picked up a pen in front of her on the table to sign with a flourish. No one would find out from her. Okay, we begin. The back wall lit up again. The Great Christmas Contest was plastered across the top of the makeshift screen, and under it were bullet points. Each of you will be given $5,000, which you must spend on other people before Christmas Day. $5,000. I don't think I've spent that much on Christmas gifts in my lifetime, Christian mumbled. Chloe wagged her head, smug as a bug in a Christmas rug. 
you cannot spend the money on one person, you cannot spend the money on a family member, and you cannot benefit from spending the money on a neighbor or friend. If you have to make your gift giving anonymous to make that happen, that's okay. Here's a copy of the rules so you don't forget. Mr. Takashiro handed out the sheets. However, your gifts cannot be random. They must be thoughtful. You have to meet a need, make a Christmas wish come true. Become Santa. Samantha chewed her lip. In addition to the selflessness requirement, we stipulate that you must spread the funds between at least 20 people or families. The funds can be allocated however you choose, but if you don't give to 20 people, you will be disqualified. Your videographers will keep count, so make sure you keep them in the loop. Misha raised her hand. What if I don't know 20 people? Then meet them. Christmas wishes come in all shapes and sizes. Misha's face paled. Samantha felt her pain. She didn't know more than two people in her building and the few co-workers in her department. How she was going to find meaningful gifts for strangers was a mystery. Finally, you'll each have a videographer follow you on your quest. They'll be in charge of editing your submissions, but they can't influence your decisions on how to spend the money. Pretend they aren't there, but be nice to them, it's Christmas. They all chuckled lightly. What if we break a rule or are disqualified? Asked Miller. Or just don't want to participate. Nothing bad will happen. If you choose to take the money and go on vacation, that is your choice. However, you also forfeit your chance at the grand prize. Will viewers know what we're competing for? Asked Christian. Samantha nodded. Good question, she mouthed at him. Mr. Takashiro took off his glasses and cleaned them with his paisley silk tie. Yes, an announcement will be posted on the channel within a week. Mrs. Woolbridge would like to use the competition to market the Santa tree. Smart. The Santa tree in the middle of the children's area was covered in ornaments with a child's name, sizes, and needs. Some needed pants, others coats. A customer could pick an ornament, buy the item, and donate it while doing their Christmas shopping. The program was successful in providing clothing for a hundred children every year. Which means that at least in some of the video, you'll need to wear a Santa suit. We have one in each of your sizes here. You may take it with you. And no, you may not use the Santa tree to help you win the contest. It's considered a charity and off the list. Misha mouthed a curse word. Samantha bit back her smile. If there are no other questions 6. Wait, when are we supposed to do this? Asked Chloe. Whenever you can. We'll let you have one paid shift a week off, but with Christmas right around the corner, three French hens needs all hands on deck. I already received a stern talking to from Mr. Torres for taking these two when Mrs. Woolbridge wasn't coming back this morning. He gestured to Samantha and Christian. If you'll sign the releases allowing us to film you, I'll give you a preloaded visa card and you'll be on your merry way. Samantha glanced over the three-page document and signed quickly. She was the first to receive her card. It had her name on it and looked like any other credit card, yet she held it with a clenched fist. Five thousand dollars were loaded onto that little metal strip, and she was terrified she'd lose it. Christian was second in line. He tucked his card into his pocket and left his hand in there, afraid to let it go. She teased him, afraid to spend it. There was an unease in his eyes that stopped her from wanting to tease him more. The group in the red hoodies peeled away from the wall and made their way around the room. They seemed to already know who they were assigned to, because they zeroed in on different people. A tall man who looked like Anthony Hopkins in Silence of the Lambs stepped in front of Samantha. Instead of the creepy way Anthony had of making Samantha's skin crawl, the man's eyes were brown and warm and he smiled easily. Hi, I am Victor. I will make you beautiful episodes that make women cry and men want to kiss babies. Victor had a Santa suit slung over one shoulder, his fingers hooking the top of the hanger. That was good enough for Samantha. Thanks. I look forward to working with you. He nodded like he expected nothing else. A woman almost as tall as Victor but thinner by four-fifths stood in front of Christian. She pulled off her hoodie and dropped it into a chair. Hey, I'm Julia. I graduated top of my class from Juilliard and all I got was this crummy job working with you. She stuck her hand out for Christian to shake. Samantha snorted a laugh and then covered it up with a cough. Christian shook Julia's hand. Well, let's hope we win an Emmy. Whatever. Julia shoved his Santa suit at his chest, the plastic bag protesting at the rough treatment. He wrapped both arms around the heavy bag and held on tight. Here's my number. She put a sticky note on his forehead, probably since his hands were full. Call me when you're ready to start. She tossed her long red braid over her shoulder, snatched up the hoodie she would probably never wear, and made her way out of the room. Christian looked like he'd been approached by the Wicked Witch of the West. 
She's fun, Samantha squeaked. And tough to win. Victor cracked his knuckles. I see her work. She make me want to lay down and let kittens lick my face. Samantha whipped her head around to see the last of Julia's black sweater flutter behind her as she rounded the corner. Wait, what? She asked Victor. I send you link. You will want kittens too. He pressed a sticky note with his number onto the garment bag in her hands. Call me. We start soon. Sure. Samantha nodded as Victor left. She set her Santa costume over the back of a chair and plucked the note off Christian's forehead. He dumped his suit next to hers. Thanks. I wasn't sure if she'd put a curse on it or not. Since you pulled it off, the curse is on you. Samantha chuckled. I'll take my chances. He rubbed the back of his neck. So, you probably have a dozen ideas already, don't you? She tipped her head from side to side. I thought I might buy Julia a personality. He chuckled. I doubt they make them in her size. A silent sigh of relief swept through her at his dismissal of his videographer. Julia was stunning in a puffy lipped, clothes draped beautifully across my body, natural redhead way. Even with her sour outlook on life, guys would take a second look. Christian didn't, though. He'd looked scared of her. That was just fine with Samantha, though she had no idea why that made her so happy. How about you? She was more than a little curious to see what he would do with the money. Christian kept his private life close to his vest. He was fun to laugh with in the moment and easy to talk to about day-to-day -day things, but they didn't delve into one another's background, which suited Samantha just fine, considering her background included her womanizing father. I'm drawing a blank. He pulled back his chin and widened both eyes. Honestly, I have no idea what I'm doing here. I'd donate the whole thing to Big Brothers, but six. But six, Samantha prompted. Besides it being a charity in off-limits, she sensed there was something deeper going on here. He shook his head. Do you know what the most dangerous gift is? Samantha paused for a moment. Dynamite. He smiled sadly. No, the most dangerous gift is hope. He pulled the card out of his pocket and ran his fingers over his name. Suddenly I have more hope than I have in years, and six, he looked up and locked eyes with Samantha. I'm scared. Samantha closed the few feet between them, wanting to offer comfort to the troubled waters swirling behind his eyes. She spoke low. What are you? Why are you still here? Mr. Takashiro waved his hands at them. They looked around and found the room had emptied while they talked. Go out there and be giving. You can't win by staying here. Christian laughed, and the seriousness of the moment they'd almost shared went up in a puff of smoke. Samantha was still thinking about what Christian had said hours later. Scared. What a strange thing to say. His almost confession left her puzzling over what could frighten a man like Christian. She meditated over it right up until her shift ended and she was confronted with the reality of giving away five grand. How exactly did one go about doing that? Chapter 4 some would say that New York was dingy in the winter. Dirty clumps of snow gathered in the corners, left over from the last storm that had as much punch as a Christmas party. But Christian always thought this was the time of year when the city brightened. Fairy lights appeared, some blinking on and off, others burning brightly. Scarves in every color of the rainbow could be seen in a two-block stretch along 34th Street, and whimsical decorations appeared in windows. The city sidewalks streamed with shoppers, which gave the impression that a person was never alone, someone was always within elbowing distance. However, walking in the midst of a hundred strangers with a Santa suit over one shoulder was the perfect place for Christian to become lost in his thoughts. This contest was like a miracle hovering out there, just waiting for him to grab on and run with it. Like his dad used to say, you have to risk a lot to win a lot. Risk, something Christian wasn't very good at. He used his key on the front door of his building and shut it firmly behind him. A couple of weeks ago there'd been a break-in and the super blamed everyone in the building for leaving the door hanging open. Christian had enough trouble, he didn't need to leave an open door for it to walk through. He approached the stairs, not bothering to glance up the five flights before beginning the climb. Lucky had already upped his monthly payments just because he found a good deal on a clearance suit. What would happen if he was caught spending thousands of dollars in a couple of weeks? He'd have his tail handed to him. He'd have to be so careful. So very, very careful, because six, well, he wanted to win. He wanted to own French hens. Something inside of him whispered it was destined to be. That this was his path to med school. There was a sprig of mistletoe at the top of the landing. He shook his head, wondering which of his neighbors had taken the time. Probably the woman in 5G. She had a big wreath with shiny snowflakes on her door. 
He'd helped her carry her groceries up the stairs once while she'd carried her sleeping toddler. Hey boy, Christian, is that you, dear? Called a feeble voice. Christian moved toward apartment 5B. Hi, Mrs. Knapp. Her door was ajar and he pushed it all the way open, drawing a small protest from the hinges. You shouldn't leave your door unlocked like that. Pish. She flapped a veined and age-marked hand. I've got nothing to steal. She waved him into the room from her faded orange recliner. The room was golden with low lamplight, comfortable. An oval braided rug covered most of the living room floor, the colors long faded but the softness increasing with time. A crochet project was bunched up next to her chair while two skeins of navy yarn waited their turn on the side table. He laid the Santa suit over the back of the couch and took a seat. I've lived in this apartment all my life. We used to throw open the windows in the summer and call across the alley to our friends. Our doors were constantly open. Now everybody's so afraid. Her wrinkled brows lowered until he couldn't see her eyes anymore. You've had your hair done. He pointed to the light blue cast on her gray head. It looks lovely. Thank you, dear. She patted her, do. Now, I wonder if you could change the light bulb in my hallway. I tried earlier but couldn't reach. Of course. He popped up, grateful to have a task. The new bulbs are in the hall closet. She groaned as she got to her feet but made her way into the kitchen with grace. He opened the closet door and was greeted with the smell of mothballs. Two faded jackets and a few sweaters hung on wire hangers. The bulbs were on the shelf above the rod. In no time, he had light shining in the hallway again. Thank you, dear. She beamed up at him, her smile full of gratitude. There are good people in this world, and you're one of them. He chuckled. It was just a bulb. Well, I'm grateful, and to show you, I made fudge. She held up a plate full of equally sized squares. Just now. Mrs. Knapp, you're a wonder. He took the plate from her, examining the fudge as if it were made of magic, earning himself a slap on the arm. I made it hours ago, when the light went out. Thanks. I'll enjoy every morsel. He popped one in his mouth, the heavy chocolate melting over his tongue. You could share, you know. He lifted the plate to offer her one. Not with me. She threw her hand over her chest and scolded him with a look. With a young lady. The feeling of Samantha in his arms the other day overtook him and he choked on the fudge. She'd felt so right against his chest, like she'd been formed to be a part of him and he a part of her. He'd held on to her right up until she'd pulled away, taking as much comfort from her warmth as he tried to give. If there was one woman who would tempt him six, but he couldn't. He couldn't put Samantha, or anyone else, in Lucky's path. Staying unattached meant that he was the only one who would get hurt if he screwed up. I'm in no place to date someone. Pish. You're in the perfect place. A young man like you should be out on the town, dancing at clubs, flirting with pretty girls. He shook his head. I don't have time for that. Make time. She poked him in the chest. The train of life is chugging on by and you aren't even trying to jump aboard. He narrowed his eyes. Did you lure me over here for a lecture? She frowned. No. But since you were here anyway six. He laughed, and a spot of red caught his eye. The Santa suit. If anyone deserved a Christmas gift, it was Mrs. Knapp. What do you want for Christmas? She paused. Well, that's a good question. Come on. He folded his arms. Money's no object. If you could ask for one thing or a hundred things, what's on your list? She groped for the wall and slowly made her way to the recliner, suddenly looking much older than she had a few moments before. Christian followed behind, concerned. Mrs. Knapp. Sorry. She ripped a tissue from the box on the side table and swiped the corners of her mouth and then her eyes, which took on a faraway look. We never had much, Richard and me, but we had a whole lot of love. A strange sort of energy pulsed through him, a feeling that he had the power to help someone. It shoved him to the edge of the cushion, leaning forward. I guess six, she glanced at him quickly, and he nodded for her to continue. I guess I'd like a headstone for his grave. It's unmarked, and I've always felt bad that I didn't do better by him, but by the time I paid for the casket six, her shaking hand covered her mouth for a moment before she straightened up. Well, that's what you get for asking, an old weepy woman's regret. This was perfect. A headstone fit all the requirements for the contest. Christian patted her knee. I'm sure your love was more than enough for Richard, Mrs. Knapp. She smiled sadly and lifted her palms. It was all I had to give. Would that you were thirty years younger. He winked, making her blush. More like fifty years, but I'll let that one slide. They laughed, and he took another bite of fudge as he stood up. I'd better get home and make myself some dinner or I'll eat all this and the plate too. 
and he had some research to do on headstones. Okay, dear, you think about what I said about finding yourself a lady. Thanks for the fudge, he said noncommittally as he snatched up his suit. They said goodbye and he shut her door firmly behind him. She wouldn't lock it until bedtime, but at least it wasn't an open invitation for trouble. With a new bounce in his step, he hurried to his own door and inserted the key. With any luck, he'd be able to get a headstone for Richard, mark off one of his twenty good deeds, and bring some well-earned light into Mrs. Knapp's eyes. As he went about making dinner for one, he found himself thinking more about a dinner for two with Samantha. He was so caught up in the image of the two of them sitting at his table, a single candle flickering in Samantha's brown eyes, that he forgot about the soup and burned it to the bottom of the pan. Chapter 5 You do many small gifts. I make montage, said Victor. Samantha struggled to keep five boxes from sliding out of her arms and landing on the sidewalk. Not that anything was breakable, but she wanted the wrapping paper to look nice. Victor had a small camera bag slung over his shoulder and a handheld recorder. Nothing big and fancy like she saw Hollywood types use when they closed off a street for filming, which didn't happen often, but enough that she knew a professional camera was big and black. Victor's palm-sized silver one left her doubting his abilities. He jogged in front of her and flipped open the small screen. Okay, you tell me about gifts, but you were there when I bought them. He rolled his eyes, his bald head reflecting the streetlights above. Tell camera. Oh. She gathered her thoughts. Okay. So, when I was little, my dad wasn't around a lot. Where mom? Mom was gone. You have no mom. Victor lowered the camera, his face a mask of concern. Oh my gosh, Victor. This isn't about me. She looked pointedly at the camera. But you started with your story. She let out a heavy sigh as she skirted a couple too caught up in one another's gaze to care that they almost ran her over. Anyway, Victor brought the camera back up. So I was home alone, right? And there was this older couple a few doors down who would check in on me. They, um, they have a special needs son, so one of them was always home. She blushed, thinking of the way dad had dropped her on their doorstep, unannounced and uninvited. Though they always welcomed her with open arms, the surprise in Mr. Irving's eyes told her all she needed to know and the contrast between the man leaving her on the doorstep and the one offering a hug. It was also enough to tell her what she needed to know about the kind of man her father was. So their son, David, loves Star Wars. He's totally obsessed with it, but Star Wars toys aren't cheap, so he doesn't have many. I think he's had the same ones all his life. She lifted a shoulder. When I thought about making someone's Christmas, I thought of David. Why not buy his parents' gift? Because they'll get more joy out of watching David open these than they would if I bought them something. Good people. The best. Mr. Irving tutored me in math all through high school. He's an accountant. And Mrs. Irving always bought me a new shirt for the first day of school. Her eyes burned with unshed tears. She laughed at herself. Look at me. I'm a mess. You'd better not put this in the video. Victor chuckled but didn't comment. Samantha slowed her steps. That's the one. She nodded towards the two-story brownstone with crumbling front steps and a giant Christmas tree in the front window. The red curtains were thrown wide to allow people passing by to partake of the festiveness. In contrast, her place next door was dark and dreary. Dad must have gone out for the night. She prayed he'd cleaned up after himself and she wouldn't have a sink's worth of dishes to do when she went inside. Victor poked his head out from behind the lens. What are you waiting for? She took a deep breath. I can't decide if I want to drop them on the doorstep or take them in. She chewed her lip as she thought. The Santa suit was in her room. She could easily slip inside and put it on. Take them in, better footage. That sealed it. She wasn't here to exploit the Irvings. That was something her father would do. We'll leave them on the doorstep. Victor scowled. Don't look at me like that. He didn't move towards the stoop. Are you coming? She assumed he'd want shots of the gifts on the step. He wrinkled his forehead, which in turn wrinkled the top of his bald head. Let's open one so I can at least get his reaction from across the street. She was shaking his head before he finished. I want David to open them all, but if you want to win, I need reaction. She closed her eyes. Do we really? Unless you can save a kitten and I can film that, then yeah. What is with you and kittens? Samantha turned to her own steps, just as old as the ones next door, and set the gifts down carefully. She selected the smallest one and unwrapped it, revealing a Darth Maul action figure. With careful fingers, she attached the tag with David's name to the neck. There. She turned it around and smiled at Victor. Happy. More so, yes. He looked over his shoulder. I film from there. 
he jogged across the street. Once he looked settled in, like some oversized hoodlum up to no good, Samantha made her way to the Irving's door. She arranged the packages just so. Her pulse spiked and she threw a huge grin over her shoulder. Counting to three in her head, she rang the bells and sprang down the steps, across the street, dodging a minivan, and hid behind Victor. Subtle, he teased her. She wasn't hiding well, her breath puffing up into the air in short bursts. A few seconds passed, and Mrs. Irving opened the door with a smile. She looked around and then glanced down, and her hand motioned to someone behind her while she called out, David, Trevor, come look at this. In a blink, the family was huddled at the door, looking down at the pile of gifts. David was bigger now, taller than his dad. His round, chubby cheeks reddened quickly in the cold. He reached out slowly for the action figure on the top. That's my name. His happy shout could be heard all the way across the street. He spun into the house, taking the toy with him and leaving the others. Samantha's grin stretched wide. Mr. and Mrs. Irving talked excitedly as they gathered up the other gifts. Thank you. Mrs. Irving called into the night, pressing her lips to her fingers and throwing the kiss out into the world before shutting the door. Samantha came out from behind Victor. She kissed her own fingers and tossed the kiss towards the front door. Thank you. For everything, she replied. Victor snapped the camera shut. I must edit. He took off at a quick stride, as if inspiration were nipping at his nose instead of Jack Frost. Not saying goodbye and not seeming to care. Samantha waved, though he didn't see it. She watched the scene through the front window of her neighbor's house. They were laughing and smiling. Maybe she should have left the gift in the morning, he looked too excited to sleep tonight. Despite her small doubts, she had a full heart. One down, nineteen to go. Chapter 6 Are you ready? Julia demanded. Christian nodded as he threw on his coat and glanced around the department to make sure he'd done his final check. He'd called Julia and explained his idea about the headstone. She thought it would be something six, something six, cinematographic to film headstones and insisted on going to the stonecutters with him. Samantha, I'm clocking out. He stepped behind her at the counter, their bodies brushing lightly in the small space. He couldn't be near her without remembering what it was like to hold her, and therefore the eight-hour shift was slow torture. He hadn't changed his mind about being single, but Samantha sure made him want to be close. She nodded quickly. I'm going to tidy up here, and then I'm off too. He clicked a few buttons on the screen at the register. See you tomorrow. Her bright smile dimmed as a child cried out in frustration. They both turned to see a young mother carrying twins. It appeared neither of the boys wanted to be held as they struggled against her. Tony, we need a gift for your grandma. Hold still for one minute, would you? Her eyes rimmed in red, foretelling the tears about to fall. Samantha rushed round the counter and held out her arms. May I? Both children quieted immediately and hugged their mom. Samantha smiled and winked. Sometimes all it takes is an offer. The mom sniffed. Thanks. She kissed one of the toddler's heads and hopped to hike them both up on her hips. My sitter cancelled last minute, but my mom is coming into town tomorrow and then flying out the next day, and I need a present for her. Her eyes pleaded for help. Christian, we have to go. The place closes in an hour. Julia wrapped a black scarf around her black turtleneck before putting on her black coat. Hang on. He held up a finger. What does your mother like? He asked the mom. Sweaters. She wears them all year long. He glanced at Samantha. They had dozens of sweaters. What color? The mom rolled her eyes. Mostly white or cream, so they'll match everything. I have just the thing for a busy mom at Christmas. Chloe swept in, wearing her Santa suit and pushing a double stroller. She didn't ask permission but took one of the toddlers, ho 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 and buckled him into the back seat while they all watched in shock and awe. Turning to face her videographer, Chloe said, being a mom is hard work with no pay and little appreciation. We should be celebrating moms every day of the year, but especially at Christmas. Smiling, she turned back to the customer. This is for you. She flourished her hands over the stroller. A gift from old Saint Nick. The mom beamed. Are you kidding? She put her other son in the front seat and buckled him in. This is amazing. You deserve it. Children are the future. Chloe continued to chat for a few moments before heading off, shaking a jingle bell as she went. Christian stared after her, speechless. Had Chloe just upstaged him and Samantha on camera? He recovered faster than Samantha and made his way over to the cashmere cardigan sweaters with overlarge buttons and floppy collars. They also had two pockets in the front, which grandmas tended to enjoy. How about this? 
he opened it up and allowed her to look it over. She fingered the yarn. I'll take it. Samantha rang up her purchase, and soon she was on her way out the door, pushing the twins in the stroller. Christian and Samantha looked at one another and then at Julia. Why do I feel like you and I should be sworn enemies right now? Christian asked her. Because you should, answered Julia. If you want to win, you have to beat all of them. She waved her arm around. And each other. But, Christian's protest died on his lips. She was right. As much as he didn't like it, his sarcastic videographer was right. Samantha narrowed her eyes. That's it. You and I can no longer be friends. She flipped her hair over her shoulder in a perfect imitation of Julia and stalked back to the dress pants, where she arranged the hangers by size. Christian smiled after her. She was giving him a hard time, and he liked it. If you keep staring at her, she's going to know you like her, Julia groused. She examined the fringe on her scarf. Christian snapped out of his goofy grin. I don't like her. Tell that to your face. Julia snapped her fingers. Can we go now? I'd like to not be on the losing team. Sure. He told himself not to look at Samantha again, but he couldn't help but glance her direction one last time. There was just something about Samantha that he didn't want to walk away from. But walk he did, and they were soon on the sidewalk. You need to be more cutthroat, Julia called over the wind. This is a dog-eat-dog -dog contest, and there's no second place. He nodded in agreement. Chloe certainly hadn't pulled any punches with her song and dance in the middle of French hens. No doubt Mrs. Woolbridge would see him and Samantha slack-jawed and motionless in the background and wonder why neither of them thought to buy a stroller. We can only hope your headstone idea appeals to viewers more than Chloe's mom's speech. She rubbed her hands together. That was good, going for the home run and all. What do you mean? Who do you think watches these things? 66% of our viewers are moms. If Chloe gets more hearts on the channel, Mrs. Woolbridge is sure to notice. Oh. Christian let that sink in as he and Julia made their way across three blocks. He pulled open the glass and chrome door to the stonecutter's display room. Got any more viewer facts that could be helpful? Yeah, they like happy endings and clean-cut guys. Work your cuteness to your best advantage. Great. That he could do. A stooped man with hands the size of basketballs appeared from behind a curtain. How may I help you? Cinema gold, Julia whispered as she scrambled for her camera and started filming. Christian had to admit, he did look like a reincarnation of Ebenezer Scrooge, black dress and all. Christian asked about headstones, prices, and inscriptions while she filmed. All the while, he couldn't help but think that this was a bad idea as far as gaining hearts. Who wanted a ghost story for Christmas? You know, besides the one by Dickens. Maybe he should back off the headstone and come up with something for a mom. Dejected because he couldn't order the stone without knowing Richard's birth or death dates, let alone where he was buried, he said goodbye to Julia and trudged home, where only a few pieces of fudge waited in an empty apartment. Chapter 7 A light snow fell as Samantha made her way home. It dusted her shoulders as if she were an antique clock in need of some care. Perhaps she was in need of attention, because she carried a sense of being cheated, and she knew just who to point the finger at, Chloe. Technically, Chloe hadn't broken any of the rules. She didn't use the giving tree, and she had made a difference for the shopper by providing a double stroller. And technically, there weren't any rules about having other contestants in your video. And technically, there weren't rules against making other contestants look like fools. But technically speaking, there shouldn't have to be rules in place for Chloe to show some respect. Samantha's footsteps grew louder as she marched up the front stairs and through the door. She slammed it shut behind her, cutting off the cold air and sending a swirl of snowflakes into the entryway. With jerky movements, she shed her coat, hat, and gloves, throwing them into the basket by the coat stand. Rough day, asked Dad. He trotted easily down the stairs, wearing a charcoal suit and a Christmas green tie. His black shoes shone and he'd trimmed up the beard to just longer than stubble. You could say that. The front room was in a state of disarray with sections of newspaper laid over the back of the couch, a blanket in a heap on the floor by the fireplace no one dared light, and a half-eaten sandwich on the coffee table. She suppressed her groan and began folding the paper back together. He picked up the sandwich and took a bite. Tell me about it. That was not going to happen. An instinct inside of her screamed that dad must never know about the loaded credit card in her purse. It took all of her willpower not to glance at the coat rack, where she'd hung it. Not much to tell. I was upstaged by another employee today. Upstaged. He spoke through his mouthful of food. When he was like this, it was hard to understand what women saw in him. Yeah. 
I was taking care of a customer and she got right in there and took over. Was this in front of people? A strangled noise escaped her throat as she thought of the growing numbers of subscribers to the French Hen's My Heart channel. A few. You're too soft. He tossed the crust into the garbage and held out his hand for the newspaper, which he stowed in the recycle bin. Samantha retrieved the blanket and began folding it with sharp, quick movements. I'm not soft. Oh, come on. You're like a little innocent lamb waiting to be made into lamb chops. You wouldn't survive a minute in the real world. Hot indignation boiled inside of her. Thanks ever so much, Dad. You'd think a girl's father would have her back. Ah, don't get your feathers ruffled. You take after your mom, God rest her soul. Dad. Samantha threw the blanket on the couch, where it immediately unfolded. Mom didn't die. Is that what you tell people? Jeez. What a wretch. He lifted his palms in innocence. Well, she could have. We don't know. Samantha crammed her fingers into her hair and grabbed at the roots. I'm not even sure we're related, old man. He came around the couch. Thankfully, you've got my good looks. He winked and kissed her cheek. Samantha's anger melted a little, though the hurt from hearing his honest opinion of her remained bright. She released her hair. You're a con artist. You can't change who you are, darling, any more than I can change my good looks. He adjusted his tie. Speaking of six, how do I look? Samantha tipped her head and squinted her eyes. Dad's hair, still dark and thick, had a natural wave. A tan lingered from his time in Mexico, and the laugh lines around his deep brown eyes served only to make him look distinguished. When she looked at him, all dressed up and ready to charm, she understood how he beguiled his way into women's lives. She sighed. It wasn't up to her to protect women from Dad's charisma. Besides, she tried to warn her best friend, and all that did was destroy their relationship. To be fair, once Dad set his eyes on Misty, the friendship was pretty much over anyway. All Samantha's counseling had done was speed up the process. As handsome as ever, he sauntered his way to the door. I'm off for cocktails and pretty ladies. Don't wait up. The door clicked shut behind him. I never do, she replied to an empty house. She went and locked the door. Leaning against the heavy wood, she surveyed the house. When Dad left with Misty, Samantha had taken over the payments and the taxes and the upkeep, but Dad still acted like he owned the place. Since his name was on the mortgage, she allowed that he did actually own the building. Which was a good thing, because it meant she could walk away at any minute. The room was much cleaner now, but still in need of a vacuum and dusting. The picture frame of her holding her high school diploma was on the mantel right over her stocking. She'd hung it knowing no one would be there to fill it, but not caring. The fake white tree with multicolored lights was in front of the window, blinking away, the ornaments she'd made in grade school hanging proudly from each bough. She should take comfort from the familiarity and mementos of Christmases gone by. Instead, they were reminders that she was stuck in life as long as she stayed in this house. Her salary barely covered living expenses. The one thing she'd credited dad for was paying down the house when he had the chance. Her mortgage payments were lower than most rents in the city. Not fit to be in the real world. Humbug. You forced me into the real world when you decided to play Casanova. She bumped her closed hand against the door as if dad would feel the reprimand. What she needed was to be out of this situation. Unfortunately, freedom cost money. She was no stranger to hard work. She'd work hard at the contest, win, and then tell dad he could have the house back, or sell it, or whatever, but she was going it alone from here on out. His sporadic visits overshadowed her ability to let loose and make connection. These constant reminders of what she was missing in life, fun, flirting, flings, were too much. Not that she wanted a fling. She dated casually, but found there was little incentive to continue with a man who only wanted her time for an evening and then insinuated that he'd take her for a night too. If she was going to date, it would be to find someone to share her life with, someone who valued her, someone who made her heart thrum. Someone like Six, Christian, but much less good-looking. She didn't need a guy that handsome or who stirred that much raw attraction inside of her. Christian was great, but he made her feel unpredictable, and if there was anything Samantha craved in life, it was predictability. She glanced at her watch and found that the Hallmark movie she'd wanted to watch would start in five minutes. She hurried to change into lounge pants and a fleece shirt, then swung through the kitchen to throw a lean cuisine into the microwave and flip on the television. Tonight, she would store up some Christmas cheer, because tomorrow, she was going to be the best darn Santa on Garland Street. A lady stopped at the sound of Victor's laughter and then walked on. She stopped a few feet later and turned back, 
her long brown hair flying out around her. Are you collecting for something? Samantha fell right back into character. Ho ho ho, only Christmas wishes. What's yours? The woman began chewing on her thumbnail. She didn't wear much makeup, but she didn't need to. Her dark brows gave exotic definition to her face. Well, now, that's the trick, isn't it? She glanced around as if making sure no one was listening in. Victor had his camera on, holding it casually in front of him. The red light was on. He cocked his head. How do I wish for something that seems impossible? That's what wishes are for. Otherwise they'd be called goals. Samantha tapped the side of her nose. Come on, out with it. Fine. I want my daughter to hug her daddy on Christmas morning. Why is that so hard? Samantha leaned closer, intrigued by the desperation and loneliness in the woman's eyes. He's on active duty, in Poland. Samantha's heart sank into her black boots. Seemingly impossible. Yeah, how long has he been gone? Six months. She wiped a tear from under her eye. So no hope of leave. She snorted. Not hardly. Samantha wrapped her in a big velvet hug. What's your name? Joni Six, Levitt. She fumbled for her phone. This is my daughter, Justice. Samantha took the phone and studied the cherub-cheeked darling with puffy hair and an infectious smile. What a beautiful name. And a beautiful girl. She handed the phone back. Thank you for sharing your wish with us. Joni half laughed, half choked. I don't know why I stopped. I'm so proud of what he does. He's an engineer, amazingly smart. I just thought maybe I could give a couple dollars to your cause and I'd feel better. You know, look around because someone always has it worse off than you. Yeah. Samantha's response came out as a whisper. Here she was, lamenting having a father at home, and this little girl was begging to have hers come home. Merry Christmas, Joni. Merry Christmas, Santa. She glanced at Victor. You too. She hurried off, her arms clutched close to her body. Samantha's sense of failure doubled. So far she'd spent a total of $536 on a bridesmaid dress for a woman who thought she'd have to skip her best friend's wedding, a pair of boots for a college student, and the toys for David. And the days were ticking by. Samantha watched Christian for a moment. He was talking to an older man in a flashy business suit and a long coat. You know what, Victor? I don't feel like trying to out Santa Christian anymore. He nodded. What next? Honestly. She put her hands on her lower back and pushed forward as she stretched. If I could, I'd spend what's left to get Corporal Levitt home, even if it was for just one day. She had a small understanding of what Christian had meant when he said hope was dangerous. You need new plan. What I need is a long bath. She smiled at him but was met with a stony face. And I guess a new plan. Call me when plan is ready. He stored his camera and was off at a brisk pace. You're not good at goodbyes, Samantha called to his retreating back. Speaking of goodbyes six, she headed over to Christian and Julia, who were deep in conversation. Hey, so we're going to take off. Christian lifted a hand to stop her from leaving. Why? I'm just six, done today. He said something to Julia, and she replied and then went the opposite way of Victor, leaving the two of them once again standing belly to belly. Below the white curls poking out of his Santa hat, Christian's eyebrows came together. Is everything okay? Not really, but that's life. She wasn't about to complain, not after talking to Joni. Come on. He held out his hand. The white glove was smudged with something black, probably from carrying the tree out. She accepted his hand, their gloves slipping easily against one another. The warmth from his hand ran up her arm and wrapped all over her body. He tugged her down the street. Where are we going? She asked. To feed our bellies, ho ho ho. Samantha allowed him to drag her along, the promise of food making it that much easier to just go with the flow. Besides, she liked the feel of his strong hand wrapped around hers. It made her heart do a shimmy and a shake. At that moment, with Christian glancing over his shoulder and his blue eyes dancing. Chapter 9 I'll have the pumpkin pie and a hot chocolate. Christian folded the beat-up menu and tucked it behind the sugar shaker. I'll have the same. Samantha added her menu to the haphazard collection. Her hair, braided tight against her scalp, looked must. The wig and beard she'd worn all morning sat atop the red velvet jacket and padding at her side in the vinyl booth. She'd worn a tight, white three-quarters sleeve shirt underneath that French hens had sold last fall and she'd probably bought on clearance this spring. She looked adorable, but he was trying not to notice. She glanced around the small bakery with three booths and a checkered floor before making eye contact and looking away again. He leaned forward, 
resting on his forearms. What's going on, Samantha? She put her elbow on the table and leaned against her fist. I don't know, I just don't think I'm going to win, so what's the point of trying? He studied her for a moment, letting his eyes roam over her smooth skin and the slight downturn to her lips. What makes you think you won't win? Did you see Miller's video that went live last night right after the announcement? The man literally saved a guy from having to drop out of college, paid off a hospital bill for a couple who were a paycheck away from living on the streets, and bought a refugee family winter gear. Christian nodded. So he had a couple good ideas. Samantha's arms flew out to the side. How did he find all these people? I thought standing in front of French hens was a good idea, but it wasn't exactly original. He clutched his heart. Ouch, Sam. He'd never shortened her name before. Using her full, given name had kept things professional between them. They were moving past professional, though. I thought it was original when I thought it up. She smirked at him, and he saw a bit of the woman he worked with every day peek through the discouragement. Their pie and hot chocolate arrived. He thanked their server and they ate in silence for a moment. Samantha smeared the whipped cream over the top of the pie with her fork, looking at it but not really seeing it. There was one woman today that kind of got to me, yeah. He nudged his foot forward until their boots were touching. She looked up, and he was caught by the depth of sincerity in her brown eyes. She wanted her family to be together on Christmas. Her husband's deployed. He chewed slowly. Brave man. She was really proud of him for serving but missed him terribly. Samantha smiled sadly. I felt so useless. You know. I do. He thought of Mrs. Knapp's wish for a headstone and knew exactly what Samantha was talking about. He'd gone back to Mrs. Knapp's apartment to see if he could get any more information about her husband, but she wasn't feeling well and so he'd left without a lead. Wanting to offer some support, he placed his hand over Sam's. Warmth shot up his arm and hugged his heart before spreading through his whole body. The noise of the bakery faded away, the bell over the door, the chatty clerk, the clinking of silverware on plates, all of it blurred together and then faded out. Samantha's big doe eyes grew wider, like she too could feel that something was different, connective. Christian didn't dare move. Didn't want to do anything that would stop the feelings of home and desire and Christmas morning and sledding down the tallest, fastest hill that ran through him, all coming from where his hand touched Sam's. So, how's everything over here? The server's nasally voice popped the strange bubble of time and space and attraction. Samantha snatched her hand away. Fine. Just fine. Thank you. You're welcome, sweetie. She fiddled with her napkin and kept her head down. Christian shoveled two bites of pie in his mouth. Whatever had just happened between them, whatever feelings he may have for Samantha, were better left unexplored. She wasn't a woman hardened to the world, but he would bet dollars to candy canes that she didn't have to deal with a brute of a man who garnished her paychecks. And he preferred to keep it that way. You shouldn't give up on the contest. Why not? Because six, he groped for a reason. Because it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. A golden ticket. She stared out the window. Even if I don't win, I get to help people at Christmas time, she conceded. True. Duh. He should have led with that. He watched her while she watched the street traffic. The first time he'd met her was her first day at French Hens. She'd had on a black skirt and a white button-up shirt, nothing fancy. And her hair was up in some twisty thing. But he was caught off guard, thrown for a loop by her appearance in his life. He remembered thinking you're early, and then thinking he was an idiot because she was there to work, not to be his. Over time, they'd become comfortable around one another, but he'd always kept her at arm's length. As afternoon sun bathed her cheeks in soft golden light, he had the feeling that maybe she was meant for him and he for her. She turned away from the window and he ducked, embarrassed to be caught staring. Thanks for the food. She took a sip from her cocoa mug. Don't quit, Sam. He liked shortening her name, it made him feel closer to her. You had fun this morning, right? For most of it. She smiled. The kids were so cute. Yeah, when they don't grab onto you like suction cups. He'd had to help a mother rip her son off his leg at one point. Her small smile stretched into a grin. I thought for sure you were going to walk around with him sitting on your boot all morning. If his mom hadn't offered to buy him a donut, I probably would have. She laughed, and the sound of it lightened his heart. I guess Santa can't compete with pastry. Their chuckles died off and she grew serious again. Do you think I'm a pushover? What? I don't know. Someone told me recently that I had no killer instinct, that I wasn't cut out for the fast lane. You were pretty determined this morning. I thought you were going to sumo wrestle me for the filming location. The corners of her mouth tugged up. I think if you wanted something bad enough, 
nothing could stand in your way. Is that a killer instinct? Probably not. But that just means you aren't willing to hurt others to get your way. Some would say that was a positive character attribute. He lowered his chin, encouraging her to make eye contact. When she did, he said, there's nothing wrong with being a good person. She let out a breath. Thanks, Christian. The way she said his name like she valued his opinion, like she valued him, made his heart race. Of course, you realize I'm still going to out Santa you. She burst into a laugh and covered her mouth with her hand. You were so funny. Merry Christmas. She mock copied his outburst form earlier. He grabbed his stomach, teasing her. Ho ho ho. They laughed at themselves and then at each other, and by the time they left the bakery, Christian knew Samantha was a woman he could fall in love with, if only he were free to fall. Mr. Takashiro's brow furrowed. On just one project or on the whole thing. The whole thing. Christian was being presumptuous now and he knew it, but he wanted all the time with Samantha he could get. He cut a glance to Samantha and was relieved to see she wasn't panicking. Perhaps she wanted to spend time with him too, or maybe she was too overwhelmed to want to continue on her own. She had seemed pretty down yesterday. Mr. Takashiro got to his feet so fast his chair rolled back and hit the wall. You can't just go changing things in the middle of the contest, Mr. Malone. Do you have even a small clue as to how much work this would mean for my staff? Christian cringed. He hadn't thought about any of that. All he'd been thinking about were apples and cinnamon. Samantha scooted to the edge of her chair, her back straight. Not as much as you'd think. We'll still give away our individual $5,000 and help at least 10 people each. He tapped the ends of his fingers together. I have to make a phone call. Instead of sitting at his desk and picking up the receiver, he stormed from the office, slamming the door behind him. Samantha widened her eyes in mock horror. Remind me not to ask for a raise this year. Christian twisted in his seat so he could look at her better. If there was only one perk to combining their resources, it would be the chance to look into those stunning brown eyes each day. He shouldn't allow his infatuation free reign or he'd do something stupid like ask her on a date or try to kiss her. By keeping the focus of their outings on the contest, they'd have a purpose, goals, and assignments that would keep his mind from thinking about how her lips would taste. The door flung open and Mr. Takashiro entered, his cell phone out in front of him. I'm here with them now. Good. Good. Mrs. Woolbridge's voice came through the speaker. Christian and Samantha immediately perked up. Samantha grabbed the edge of the desk. Mrs. Woolbridge, how are you? We miss you so much. Aren't you a dear, Samantha? I'm doing well. I have a personal trainer who keeps me moving, and I'm in a pottery class. I get positively covered in mud and I love it. Christian chuckled. I'll bet you give them all a run for their money. I do, Christian dear. I do. And it sounds like you are doing the same to Mr. Takashiro. Mr. Takashiro set the phone in the middle of the desk and gathered his chair behind him before sitting down. The frown on his face told them he agreed, they were stressing him out. We didn't mean to cause problem six, Samantha lifted her shoulders at Mr. Takashiro. But you want to join forces? Asked Mrs. Woolbridge. Why? Christian glanced over to see if Samantha was going to answer. She motioned for him to do so, because we're trying to do the impossible. There was a pause that lasted long enough for the Grinch to steal Christmas. I like it. I'll allow the change, but only if you understand that we can't change the requirements. Even if you get all the hearts on the channel, you'll have to abide by the rules in order to qualify to win three French hens. Not only will that keep the contest fair for the other contestants, but it will save work for Mr. Takashiro. We understand, said Samantha. Do you? That means you're still competing against one another for hearts and will need to post separate videos. Yep, we're good. Christian leaned over to Samantha and whispered, rock paper scissors who has to tell Julia. She covered her mouth to stifle her laughter. Mr. Takashiro was going over some details with Mrs. Woolbridge about what to tell the other contestants. That's on you, big guy. She's your videographer, she whispered. He slouched in his seat. Okay, but if you don't hear from me for a couple days, have them drag the East River. Her shoulders shook in silent laughter. If that's all, then I'd like to get back to my lunch, Mrs. Woolbridge announced. Mr. Takashiro bowed slightly to the phone. Yes, yes, so sorry to interrupt. Everyone cheered a goodbye, and Mr. Takashiro hung up the phone. He looked at the two of them. Well, what are you waiting for? Get going. They made it out to the lobby and into the elevator, where they exchanged tentative smiles. Aside from being kicked out of his office, I'd say that went well, Christian quipped. Samantha relaxed and settled against the wall next to him, their arms brushing. 
We need a game plan. Have you been keeping track of everything? To the penny. Let's meet up at the bakery tomorrow morning and go over stuff. I'll call Victor tonight, and you talk to Julia. He groaned at having to talk to his eccentric camera woman, bringing a smile to Samantha's lips. Caught up in the way his heart was beating like a big bass drum, Christian reached out and pushed a stray hair behind her ear. The doors swooped open and Samantha bolted out, calling over her shoulder, I'll see you in the morning. Nine o'clock. Okay. Okay, he called to her retreating figure. He cursed himself for crossing the line. He'd made Samantha feel uncomfortable, and that wasn't right. From here on out, he was going to behave himself. Unless there was mistletoe. If they happened to be under a sprig, then he had to follow tradition. Having given himself a smidgen of permission to do something he knew was only going to break his heart, he whistled his way back. Chapter 11 Samantha jolted awake to the sound of a lamp falling over. Her breathing was loud in the dark. A sliver of light rimmed the blackout curtains covering the window. A thump came through her open bedroom door, and her hands started to shake. She reached for the mace on her nightstand and slid out from between the cotton sheets as quietly as she could. The rustling of her pajama bottoms sounded like a war cry to her ears, and she prayed that the intruder wasn't listening as hard as she was at that moment. She reached the doorway, bracing her empty hand against the door jamb and raising the mace in front of her. The light flipped on, momentarily blinding her. She brought her free arm across her eyes and screamed, releasing a spray of mace. Her dad cursed and threw himself against the opposite wall, his arms covering his head. Don't shoot, don't shoot. Samantha released the trigger and dropped the canister. It thudded and rolled under the hall table. Dad. She missed him, but there was a nice wet streak across the floor and on the wall. Thankfully he'd been a few feet out of range. Geez, Samantha, you could have killed me. He ran his hands over his chest, checking for bullet holes. It's mace, Dad, not a gun. She flipped around and headed back into her room, angry that he'd woken her after it had taken her so long to fall asleep. When Christian had tucked her hair behind her ear, he'd done so with such tenderness that he could have poured her into a hot chocolate mug and served her for breakfast. The feeling should have gone away, but it followed her, dogging her every thought as she did some research on his impossible Christmas wish, until she finally nodded off to sleep from pure exhaustion. Now she was awake again, and all she could do was calculate how many hours she had until they met up at the bakery. Seven hours and twelve minutes. She was hopeless. You could have given me a heart attack. Dad followed her into the room. You're not that old. Samantha snatched her pillow and gave it a good fluff. Why were you attacking me? Samantha stiffened as he walked the perimeter. He picked up her snow globe, the one he bought her for Christmas when she was twelve, and shook it so the snow swirled in all directions. I heard a noise and thought someone broke in. I didn't expect you back tonight. He looked her over with a critical eye only her dad seemed to have. I'd worry you were hiding a guy in here, but if you were, you wouldn't be wearing snowman pajamas. She glanced down at the fleece bottoms and loose t-shirt top. She liked this pajama set. Any guy worth having over will like my pajamas. Christian would like them. He was the one who'd helped her choose between the snowmen and the candy canes. You know, if you want to catch a man, you've got to wrap the package a little better. Dad, I'm not wearing this on a date. When was the last time you had a date? Two days ago, she harumphed. If you count Christian buying her pie and talking, which she doubted her dad would. Oh yeah. He perked up like a gossipy old woman noticing a juicy tidbit of information dangling in front of her. What did you do? He snatched a twenty off her dresser. Do you mind if I borrow this? I'll pay you back at the first of the month. No, you won't. You know me so well. He winked as he stuffed the bill in his back pocket. So about this date. She turned away from him and began straightening her sheets so he wouldn't see the disappointment on her face. Though who she was more disappointed in, him for taking the money or her for letting him, she wasn't sure. It wasn't a big deal. We had pie and talked. Are things serious between you two? No. Not if I can hide my feelings better. She'd almost leaned into his body and invited a kiss today. Her instinct to do so was so strong it initiated the fight-or-flight response 6, and she'd fled. She needed to change the subject, and fast. Where were you tonight? With a lady friend. He used her hairbrush. She had a hard time saying goodnight. He gave his reflection a James Bond smile. Samantha rolled her eyes. And who does she think you are? A private investor. Dad, she censured. Her stomach soured thinking of the poor woman he was working over. As far as she could tell, he didn't take more from them than a good time, but she wasn't sure where his money came from. 
For all she knew, he flattered them into paying for everything from dinners to new clothes. She couldn't bring herself to ask particulars. What? He countered. I invest. In what? In you, the house. Anytime I buy a product, I'm investing in that company's success. Yep. Better to not know. She pulled back the covers on the bed she just made and sat against the headboard. Dad stopped casing her room and plucked at the sweater she'd hung on the door for tomorrow. She also had a loose skirt picked out that hit her about mid-calf. The look was on trend, but she suddenly felt self-conscious about her decision. Perhaps because her dad's frown was so deep he could have tied his shoes with it. Do you like this guy you're seeing? Heaven help her. Maybe. He rubbed his thumb over his fingers. Then take some advice from your old man. Ditch the grandma clothes and wear something a little sexy. What parent, in the history of parenting, tells their daughter to dress sexy? There was something seriously wrong with her relationship with her father. She'd known it for years, but to have it confirmed was always a punch in the stomach. He made his way to the door, where he paused. I'm not wrong. He left, shutting her door behind him. Living with four roommates with heavily shedding cats would be better than this. She flung herself down into her pillows. Perfectly respectable pillows that anyone would look at and think the woman who owned them was responsible. How had she ended up with a father who would probably think a sparkling miniskirt was casual attire? She rolled to her side and brought her legs up to her middle. With dad around, she always felt tainted. She didn't want people to know they were related, and that made her feel guilty. Rarely did she leave one of their encounters feeling good about herself. She couldn't help but contrast how she felt around her father to how she felt around Christian. She decided to focus on Christian and their meeting, which was not a date, no matter what she'd told her dad. The feel of his big hand holding hers, their fingers intertwined, allowed her to smile. His pinky finger was curved inward, like it had been broken at some point. She yawned. She'd have to ask him about that one day. She wanted to know all about him. Maybe she should change her outfit. After all, dad may have been a horrible father for an adult woman, but he was a man. Every year, we'd head down to the Santa tree at three French hens and answer as many Christmas wishes as we could. She nodded towards the small tree. We kept the ornaments, and I still use some of them to decorate. It reminds me to be thankful for what I have. That's a beautiful tradition. Samantha's eyes roamed the aged furnishings, the faded rug, and the contented woman with her project growing in her capable and talented hands by the minute. Richard especially liked to care for the little ones, the babies. He could pick out a pair of footed pajamas like no one else. They all chuckled, warming to the subject. But my specialty was the young teens. The 13 to 15 year olds. I was one hip dresser back in my day. I'll bet you were. Christian winked at her. Mrs. Knapp's eyes landed on his arm, still touching Samantha's back, and something clicked behind her eyes. She settled back in her chair, looking smug and quite proud of herself. Christian practically darted across the room, where he bent over to press a kiss to Mrs. Knapp's cheek. Thank you for the cookies and the visit. We've got an errand to run and need to go. Mrs. Knapp's faded eyes danced. I'll bet you do, honey. She patted his cheek. You get on going, you hear. He laughed and wagged a finger at her. Don't start with me. She wagged her finger right back. Everyone said goodbye. Victor paused to kiss the back of her hand. Julia waved from the doorway. Samantha stooped to offer a hug. Thank you for the cookies. Of course. You come back any time. You don't have to bring Christian along to be welcome here. She patted Samantha's cheek like she had Christian. I'm claiming you as one of mine. Okay. Samantha practically glowed. First Christian's kiss and now this darling woman was offering her love and acceptance. They filed out to the hallway and Christian shut the door behind them. Julia wrinkled her nose. Well, that was a bust. I beg to differ. Samantha lifted her chin. Julia's pessimism and harshness were wearing on her. She'd much prefer working with Victor, who always had a smile. I think we have plenty of information to fill a headstone. Speaking of headstones, came a deep chainsmoker's voice from down the hallway. Samantha stumbled as Christian thrust her behind him just as a man as big as the hallway advanced on their group. Her pulse thrummed, pounding loudly in her ears. Julia stepped in front of Victor, looking like a mother alley cat trying to protect her kitten. Great. Now Victor had her thinking about kittens too. The man had a scar that ran through his eyebrow and a swollen lip that made his already ugly features look dangerous. His black jacket had seen better days and his pants were either artfully distressed or worn in well. He carried himself like a man looking for a fight, and the way he looked over their group had goosebumps jumping out on Samantha's arms. Lucky. Well what are you doing here? Stammered Christian. 
Samantha grabbed on to the back of his jacket. You know him, she whispered. Christian barely nodded in response. Aren't you going to introduce me to your friends? Lucky eyed the camera bags with feral hunger. No, Christian said. Samantha's body went rigid. She prayed. She prayed so hard her prayer would have knocked over the pearly gates. She begged God for an angel to watch over them right now, preferably one of those avenging angels who wiped out cities and took down. Yeah, he's like a character in a book that has this whole interesting life story and no one outside of the reader knows about it. Without missing a beat, she grabbed his sleeve and pulled him to the side. What do you think of this? She pointed at a double headstone with entwined hearts in the middle. The words love lasts forever ran just underneath the design. We could have her name and birth date engraved on it, and then, when she passes, they'll add the death date. Christian put on the mental brakes. No way, he stepped away from her. I'm not jinxing her like that. Samantha twisted her lips. It's not jinxing someone. I saw it in the sample book. Besides, if she's been thinking about a headstone for him all this time, wouldn't she be glad to know she'd have one too? Fear stemming from an unsure future and the thought of losing someone else he cared about made Christian mad. You may not have known her long, but if you did, then you wouldn't say something like that. She held up her palms. Okay, I'm sorry. I just thought it would be a nice idea. Well, it wasn't. He stomped over to the counter. We about done here. Ollie finished the final number in the death date before asking, did you have an inscription of some kind? Christian ran his hands through his hair. He'd not come up with anything, but he felt like there should be something said about this man. Mrs. Knapp would like that a lot. But what was there to say? Samantha took the order pad and reached for another pencil stub. She wrote as she spoke. True love is bigger than heaven and earth. She turned the pad around and slid it back to Ollie. Ollie looked at Christian for confirmation. Chills swept over Christian and he closed his eyes, thinking of Mrs. Knapp and the way she talked about her husband. Not as if he were still around, but like their love was going strong despite the vast distance between them. Yeah, I think that about covers it. They finished up and he pulled out the shiny visa card to give Ollie a down payment. It would take a few days for the granite to arrive, and Ollie promised to call when he was done. The group headed for the door. Once on the sidewalk, they stopped to wrap up in their winter gear. Julia waved before disappearing in the crowds. She hadn't said much inside the stonecutter's place, which was odd for her. Christian figured Lucky's visit had cast a cloud over the group. Victor stared at the door for a minute. Working with you too is complicated. My heart. He pounded his fist against his chest. I have growing pains. Christian could empathize, he'd experienced much the same thing the moment he'd kissed Samantha. The pain was beautiful and strong, and yet it changed things, changed him. But he didn't want to explain all that to Victor, so he just nodded. Or maybe they were all tender with the feeling of accomplishing that which seemed impossible only days before. Samantha hung around after Victor left. She rocked back on her heels. So, today was busy. She paused, peeking up at him from lowered lashes. You okay to go home? Yeah. No. Me. I'm fine. It's just six. That guy was kind of mean. He couldn't have her looking at him like he was the school nerd getting picked on by the football star. And he didn't want her pity. Which was why he'd vowed to stay out of a relationship until his father's debts were paid. With the increase in payments, he should be done all that much faster, assuming Lucky put the extra money towards the principal. Winning the contest would make putting Lucky and his father's hidden addiction behind him for good. Collecting rent is a thankless job, he said, trying to smile. That was your landlord. Yeah. The word was as bitter as any lie he'd ever spoken. She melted a little, the tension leaving her like steam out of a cup of cocoa. Dude needs to take a chill. He laughed uneasily, glancing around to see if Lucky was anywhere in sight. There was an alleyway two doors down with a shadow cutting across the entrance. He could be in there, watching the two of them. Shivers raced over his skin despite his warm winter coat. If Christian was free of all this, he'd offer to walk Samantha home. And he'd say yes when she invited him in for Coco. And he'd kiss her again before going back to his sad little apartment. But he wasn't free. Hey, um, about what happened earlier six, in the kitchen. She lifted her face. Yeah. He mentally grabbed a hold of his heart to keep it from struggling against what he was about to say. I shouldn't have pushed myself on you like that. I hope we can still be friends and work on the contest together. Oh, sure. Her eyes went blank like she had no way to process what he'd just said. Then they came back online and she forced herself to relax. I mean, if that's what you want. He nodded, 
unable to actually say yes when he wanted to scream no. Okay, then, we're good. Pause. I guess I had better get going. Pause. You have a good night and I'll see you at work. Night. He gave her arm a squeeze and turned away, knowing he was turning his back on so much more than he dared admit. She wouldn't understand why he'd gone cold and could accuse him of being a dishonorable reprobate who steals kisses and then runs. He was a degenerate. The only hope he had was that Samantha didn't care for him as strongly as he cared for her. That to her, the kiss was all in holiday fun, flirting that had gone too far. Please, Lord, don't let her love me. Chapter 14 Samantha kept her head down and her hands tucked into her coat. She'd wanted to invite Christian to dinner, but he'd gotten weird after talking to his landlord. The guy was seriously serious about collecting rent. One look at his steel-gray eyes and she was thankful she only had to deal with a mortgage company. They sent letters and made phone calls but had never shown up on her door looking like they wanted to tear her arms off if she was late with the mortgage. She was walking past a bistro when someone knocked on the giant glass window. Turning, she found her father waving excitedly for her to come in. On the other side of the table from him was an exotic beauty who looked like a Peruvian runway model with silky black hair, flawless olive-toned skin, and puffy lips outlined to perfection. Sarah, the esthetician at the French hen's makeup counter, would give her a standing ovation for her mastery of a mascara wand. Great, just great. Samantha ducked inside and made her way over to the window seat. Dad got up to meet her, holding his arms out like they hadn't seen each other in months. You ditched the skirt. He hugged her close. You look wonderful. Fat lot of good it did me, she muttered. Dad ignored her grumbling and introduced her to Yvette, who did indeed have a sultry accent. He scooted his chair around and took one from the table next to them for Samantha. Oh, no. I don't want to interrupt your date. Dad placed a hand on Yvette's leg. Samantha had an important date today and I'd like to hear how it went. You don't mind, do you, babe? Yvette smiled warmly, lifting her glass of red wine. We're happy to have you. At least she was gracious. Some of the younger women dad dated saw Samantha as competition for dad's time and they were cold or downright nasty. Not having a direct out, Samantha sat but didn't take off her coat. Maybe for a minute. Dad settled his napkin across his lap and took a sip of something bubbly. How did it go? Samantha sighed, figuring she didn't have anything to lose because dad would be out of the country again soon and she'd never see Yvette again, she said, I thought it was going well. We were connecting. Kissing. Yvette asked. Samantha's eyebrows jumped. Yes, she squeaked out. Yvette leaned back, smiling smugly. You look like a woman who was kissed today. I do. She glanced at her reflection in the big glass window. When you were walking the street. Your head, it was not thinking about your feet. Ha. Huh. You were thinking about a kiss. Yeah. But then this guy showed up demanding his rent and he got all distant. I don't know if the kiss meant anything to him or if we were caught up in the moment. I think you must be in love with him. Yvette nodded encouragingly. Love. Samantha blurted like she was spitting out sunflower seeds. Dad took Yvette's hand. Listen to her, sweetie. She is a professional. Samantha was almost afraid to ask. A professional what? A professional love psychic, Dad said, as straight-faced as if he'd said she was a marketing analyst or hairstylist. You know, someone with a normal job. Samantha bolted to her feet. I have to go. Yvette and Dad exchanged a quick look. Dad leaned forward, waving for her to sit back down. Don't be so closed-minded, Samantha. Come on, let her do a reading on you. Samantha twisted her gloves in her hands. It's after hours, and I'm sure she doesn't want to work while she's on a date. Yvette sat up taller and reached both hands across the table. Come, come. I would love to help Ben's daughter find love. Well, cinnamon sticks. Okay, but I'm not sure there's much to read. Give me your hand. Samantha glanced at her dad. He nodded as if she were a small child standing in line to see Santa but afraid to climb up on his lap. With great reluctance, she allowed Yvette to take her hand in both of hers. She couldn't believe she was doing this. Who uses a love psychic, and what's up with a love psychic who dates her dad? Shouldn't the woman know better than to get involved with a man who ran through women half his age like they were packets of hot chocolate mix? The dark beauty closed her huge almond-shaped eyes and hummed lightly. Samantha thought she caught a few notes of the nutcracker suite, which did nothing to bolster her confidence in whatever advice was about to come out of Yvette's mouth. I sense you have known this man for some time. She kept her eyes closed, and Samantha didn't nod or agree out loud. I'm feeling six, she hummed again for a moment. 
I feel your admiration of him, as well as love that has the possibility of being deep and abiding, the forever kind of love musicians sing about on stage, that didn't sound too bad, but six. Why is there always a but? Six, he is unreachable, there is a block in his path which he did not put there, but it is blocking him from letting his heart be yours. That was six, unexpectedly interesting, really, yes, he is falling in love with you against his will. Well, isn't that every woman's dream come true? Thanks. Samantha went to pull her hand away, but Yvette held tight. He's not the only one. You are afraid. Her eyes popped open and she stared at Dad. She's afraid because of you. Me. Dad pointed to his chest. What did I do? You are not honest with women, but most especially, you are not honest with her. Samantha had to give it to Yvette. If she wasn't psychic, she was an incredibly brave woman to throw that out there. Yvette pulled her hands back as if she'd been scalded by the knowledge encased in Samantha's cells. The seed of respect for Yvette slowly grew into a nice-sized houseplant. She could like this girl, if she could stick to her guns. Dad reached for Yvette. I admit that I've been less than truthful in the past, but I'm starting new with you. Samantha could only stare at the train wreck happening right front of her. Dad was so good, so sincere-ish, that she almost believed him. Yvette removed her hand from his. I need time to consult my spirit guides. Wish I had a few of those. Still, it wasn't an immediate melting into dad's arms, and that was impressive. Maybe this woman was different than the others. If so, dad was in for one heck of a Christmas romance. Samantha stood. It was lovely meeting you, Yvette. Thank you for the reading. Although she was pretty sure Yvette got more out of it than she had. Yvette stood and rounded the table for a hug. Oh, we're doing this. Samantha patted the back of her tiny rib cage. Yvette squeezed tighter. If you want this man's love, you must turn this block into a stepping stone for the two of you. Okay, any ideas how to do that? Yvette rubbed her hands up and down Samantha's coat sleeves. Nothing is coming, but if I receive new information when I meditate, I'll get in touch with you. That would be great. She turned to her dad, who sat frowning in his seat. When his lips were turned down, it added ten years to his face and removed some of the polish. He didn't wear vulnerability well. Perhaps he really did like Yvette. Feeling bad for having ruined his relationship just by showing up, she leaned over and kissed his cheek. Good luck. You too. She made her way through the round tables and out to the busy sidewalk. Shoppers rushed along, their arms full of Christmas surprises and their mouths set in determination. Every so often she'd see a couple holding hands as they walked, their heads tilted toward one another. As cuckoo as Yvette's occupation appeared, the woman was pretty convincing. Although it wouldn't have taken much to convince Samantha that she was in love with Christian. The question was, what was she going to do about it? Samantha scowled. Thank you for laughing at my pain. Come on, Sam. He's not doing anything illegal. The comment hit a little too close to home, and Christian wished he could retract it immediately. The funny thing was, here was Samantha, embarrassed by her father's behavior, which was well within the law, though not the social norm, and then there was him, who would have loved to introduce his dad to everyone at work even though he participated in an illegal gambling ring. The world was upside down and backwards. Illegal, no. But mortifying, yes. Samantha ran her finger over the tabletop, tracing the false grain. He's good, too. He gets women who are stunningly beautiful to fall in love with him. I met his latest girlfriend the other night, and she was so pretty she could date an Avenger. What do they see in him? If he's anything like his daughter, then they see a kind, determined person with loads of confidence and more than her share of beautiful that draws people in, sometimes against their will. Samantha's dark lashes dropped. The room shrank until there was only enough space for the two of them. The temperature went up to a warm fireside glow, and Christian wondered if he'd said too much about his feelings to pull back. Sorry, that just sorta slipped out. It's okay. I just don't feel like I fit that description. But you're... Christian didn't get a chance to finish. Draws people in six, Samantha snatched up her phone and started typing. She spoke as she typed. Dear sir, thank you for getting back to me in a timely manner. I understand that you are not able to grant leave for Corporal Levitt. What if his wife and child came to him? Would they be allowed on base for a visit? She hit send and lifted her gaze from the screen to grin at him for a moment. As if realizing what they'd been talking about before her epiphany, she stood, tucked in her chair, and backed toward the door. I've got to call Victor and see if I can get in touch with Joni. I'll see you later. He lifted a hand in farewell, feeling like she was taking all the warmth out of the room with her. 
The area actually looked dimmer without her sunshine. He dropped his head to the tabletop. Her aloofness was for the best. He stayed there until his phone dinged. It was a group text message from Samantha to him, Victor, and Julia. Meet at the bakery on the corner tonight at 7. Big news. Victor sent a thumbs up. Julia sent an okay sign. He sent a smiley face and felt like a dork. Their conversation had been friendly enough. The old playful attitude between them had been restored. But something was missing. Well, not missing. It was still there. The attraction, the good feelings, the love. What was missing was the opportunity. He'd blown it big time. He was fooling himself to think he could be around Samantha and not love her. It Chapter 16 Samantha looked around the small booth and grinned so hard her cheeks hurt. Christian sat across from her and Joni and Justice. Both Victor and Julia were setting up their cameras. They stood back, not wanting to be in the shot. Samantha tapped her foot in anticipation as they set up. One day, she'd be able to have a conversation without waiting for the cameras to start. She turned to Justice to distract her. Justice was the cutest little girl in New York City with her dark hair in two braids down the sides of her head. She had on an adorable red peacoat and a fluffy plaid skirt underneath, accented by red tights. It was all Samantha could to do keep from asking to hold her. But she had other things to take care of right now. Julia pointed at her. We're rolling. Oh, you mean you'd like me to talk now? She teased. Julia pressed her lips. Anytime. Samantha glanced around the table. Christian's hands rested on either side of a plate with a chocolate brownie in the center. She could easily reach over and brush his fingers, could do it so fast he might wonder if he'd imagined it. Pushing those thoughts away, with as firm of a hand as Christian had pushed her away after kissing her, she smiled. Thanks for coming, everyone. She filled them in on her and Christian's decision to work together to try and make Joni's Christmas wish come true. However, I got a message today from Master Sergeant Carter that said they can't give Corporal Levitt leave for Christmas. Everyone slumped. Jody's eyes instantly filled with tears. She leaned back and discreetly wiped them away so Justice wouldn't see her cry. Thank you for asking. That's the nicest thing anyone has done for me in a while. Christian handed her a napkin. I'm so sorry. Wait, that's not why I brought you here. I got a second message later. Here. She turned on the screen and read the words out loud. If you can get Mrs. Levitt and her daughter to the base, I will make sure they see Corporal Levitt on Christmas Day. She looked up from the screen, expecting to see tears of joy on Joni's face. Instead, her lower lip trembled and she pressed the back of her hand to her mouth. Christian offered her another tissue and handed Justice his phone. It was locked, but she had a great time pushing buttons and trying to unlock it. Victor cleared his throat and stared at his shoes. Julia was eating this up. Samantha glanced down at the screen making sure she'd read the correct message, before looking up again. What did I say? Joni fanned her face and looked up as if doing so would draw the tears back into her tear ducts. I appreciate the offer. What? Victor cut in. Apparently, he couldn't stand to see her sad. He was such a sensitive guy. This is big news. Good news. Christmas miracle right here. You have to go. It's just. I can't miss work or I won't make rent. She ran her hands down Justice's braids. And it's Christmas. They all knew what she meant. There wasn't enough money to leave, buy gifts, and pay bills. The knowledge smelled like burnt Christmas pudding. Silence took over as they absorbed the news. I'll donate my money. Christian met each of their gazes. When he got to Samantha, his eyes dropped to the tabletop. You can have whatever is left over after the headstone. Have you helped ten people? Asked Samantha. He lifted his cheeks. This will make seven. You. Six. And it will drain my account. Justice looked around at the drawn faces. Eight. She exclaimed. Samantha chuckled. You're right. You count two. That's eight for you, Christian. And seven for you. Joni chewed her lip. May I make a suggestion? Please. She and Christian said at the same time. You could send care packages for the soldiers. Or even checks. Money is tight all over this time of year. Then you'd help more than ten people, right? That works for me. Christian grinned. Samantha grabbed her phone and a small pad of paper from her purse, where she kept track of the money she'd spent. What do you two think? Samantha asked Victor and Julia. They stood to win a nice chunk of change if their videos won the most hearts. While they were talking, she added up some numbers. 
Victor scrunched up his face as he thought. Suddenly, all the muscles relaxed and he brightened. This is more important than money. He reached over and patted Justice on the head. Julia groaned. Bleeding hearts of the world unite, I'm in. Victor jerked back in surprise. You say yes. She glared. Yes. Don't make a big deal out of it, okay? He held his hands up in surrender. Okay. Samantha set her phone down. Guys, we have a slight problem. They all leaned forward, and it felt like the whole room was holding its breath. I'm afraid we're cutting it close. It's $2,000 for plane tickets. Hotel for four nights is $800. Plus food. Plus ground transportation will take all of my money and then some. How much do you have left? She asked Christian. He frowned. I anonymously paid rent for a single mom on my floor this month. And I, uh, six. He dropped his gaze. I bought the double headstone. I have $800 left. Why? She blurted. He played with the paper cup in front of him, now empty of hot chocolate. You were right. Mrs. Knapp deserves a marker that she was here, is here. Samantha's heart melted. If only Christian could see what a great guy he was. Victor slapped him on the shoulder. You do right thing, man. Yeah, but now we won't have enough to cover this wish. Samantha tapped the end of the pen on her chin. Not to mention the gifts for the soldiers. Julia looked like she'd swallowed a frog. Ugh. Set up a GoFundMe account and ask for donations on your video. I could hug you. Samantha lifted one arm as if she were about to give that threatened hug. You do and I'll punch you. Everyone at the table laughed except Julia. When they settled, and the sense of possibility grabbed hold of them, Samantha felt a jolt. It's December 12th. She scrambled for her coat and purse. We have to get this video up today. Pointing at Christian, she said, you, go with Joni and pay whatever you have left on your card towards her rent. Get a receipt. He nodded and began helping Justice get her coat on while Joni gathered up the small toys she'd been playing with. They were on their way to the door as Samantha rounded on Victor. You. She pointed. Find us a place to shoot this video. Something six, patriotic and Christmassy. Done. He bolted out the door, slinging his coat over his shoulders as he went. You. What? Julia demanded. Get ready to make people cry. I want tears and open hearts and open wallets, do you understand? A wicked smile spread across her face. That's my specialty. She got to her feet. I'm headed to my laptop to look through old footage. I'll need what Victor has from when you first met Joni. A matchmaking fairy landed on Samantha's shoulder. I guess that means you'll have to call him. She rolled her eyes. The things I do six. Samantha clapped her hands. This was going to happen. They were going to make a Christmas miracle. Christian's heart was pounding so loudly in his chest he was sure the microphone picked up the steady rhythm. He prayed Samantha still had hope for them. He did. The way he felt right now, he believed anything was possible at Christmas, even love for a guy in his position. Surely there was a small miracle somewhere in heaven that would allow him to follow his heart. Samantha turned back to the camera. Despite the fact that yes, we could fall flat on our faces, I'm choosing to hope this Christmas. I hope we can get Joni to Poland. I hope we can make Corporal Levitt and his brothers in arms a Christmas they'll remember for the rest of their lives. And I hope you'll join us in our quest. She paused, and then they both lifted a hand and waved. Merry Christmas. They called together. Julia sliced her hand across her throat to say cut. A feeling of accomplishment and recklessness filled Christian. He picked up Samantha and spun her around. You were brilliant. She laughed, throwing her arms out to the side and tipping her head back. I feel brilliant. She laughed at herself. He sped up, making her squeal and grab onto his neck. The contact made him slow down, and before he knew what he was doing, he let her slide down his body, clasped her cheeks in his gloved hands, and kissed her. Samantha gasped. In a heartbeat she was kissing him back, her arms holding him tight and her minty breath cool at the same time that it heated him up. He'd been so right. Hope was dangerous. And for him, Samantha was hope. Hope that he could be the man she saw in him. Because when he was with her, he felt like a better man, felt like he was worth loving. In short, Samantha was a threat to everything he'd come to believe about himself and the world. A soft moan escaped her throat, and he deepened the kiss. The world spun around them, the light blurring into a laser show beyond his closed eyelids. Somewhere, a musician played I'm dreaming of a white Christmas on a violin. He'd never heard a more romantic tune. I think this is our song, he whispered before kissing her cheek and then her neck. She giggled. Really? Yes. He pulled back. I can just see us, old and gray, with facial hair. He brushed his finger across her chin,
teasing her about her earlier comment about looking like her grandmother. Dancing to this song in front of a Christmas tree, he pressed their foreheads together. Tell me you see it too. Her cheeks dusted pink and her lashes lowered. I think I can. Giant snowflakes fell, silent and beautiful and enchanting. Samantha tipped her head back and blinked. I think I've fallen for you, Samantha. She melted against him. You think. Her eyes sparkled. I'd rather kiss. Then by all means six, she winked. They got lost in one another and the snowflakes and the magic of the season. Maybe Samantha was on to something with this whole Christmas miracle quest, because to him, letting himself love Samantha was a miracle. And the fact that she felt the same. That was Christmas through and through. The next morning, Christian awoke to a pounding at his door. He stumbled across the room in his pajamas and pulled it open without looking through the peephole. Lucky shoved his way in, followed closely behind by a man who could have been his twin. All thoughts of sleep fled as the new guy grabbed Christian by the front of the shirt and lifted his feet off the ground. The fabric cut painfully into his upper back and underarms. What's going on? He croaked. You tell me. Lucky shoved his phone in front of Christian's nose. Christian leaned back in an effort to get his bleary eyes to focus. All he could make out was a picture of him and Samantha in front of the arch last night and a dollar sign. I can't see a darn thing. Lucky nodded to his buddy and Christian was dropped to the ground. He stumbled and almost grabbed on to the brute to get his balance, but the guy moved out of the way. Lucky decided to help out by cupping the back of his head and putting the camera in front of him, though not as close this time. Christian's heart sank. It was the GoFundMe account, and there was money in it. Donations were already rolling in. He reached for the phone and opened another browser, bringing up the channel. Sure enough, Julia had posted the video around 4 that morning. He let out a sigh. He hadn't even thought about covering his face or protecting his identity last night. The only thing on his mind was the Project 6, and Samantha. What do you want, Lucky? His tone was small and made him hate himself. He pushed to his feet and squared his shoulders. He wasn't the same guy they'd pushed around. Then again, he was still saving his money for the next payment, so. 6. That left him somewhere between wanting to protect this life and feeling like the devil may care. Lucky cracked his knuckles. I want my money. I already paid you this month. Lucky leaned in close enough that Christian could smell the onion bagel with cream cheese on his breath. I want all of it. Christian sputtered. I don't have $12,000. I'll be lucky to make the extra $500 each month. Lucky snatched his phone away. Seems to me that a resourceful man like you could get the money from someplace. He pointed to the screen, indicating that the GoFundMe account was a great place to collect the funds he needed. Your sweetheart would sure be sad if you didn't dance in front of the Christmas tree next year. Christian felt the blood drain from his face. It was an odd sensation, like someone had pulled the stopper and the warmth ran right out of his cheeks. How had Lucky known about the dancing in front of the tree comment? Had he been watching them? Leave her out of this. I wasn't the one who brought her into it. Lucky shrugged. Like I said, I want my money. I can't take the miracle money, Lucky. I'll go to jail. And what about the soldiers? Lucky's friend barked a laugh. Like we care about some army brats. You don't have to end up in jail, be creative. Christian shook his head at their lack of understanding. Had they no concept of the sacrifices the men and women of the armed forces made so that Lucky and his twin had the freedom to become criminals. Lucky's friend laid a huge hand on Christian's shoulder, pressing down hard and making it difficult for Christian to stay standing. He pushed against him, though, unwilling to bend on this one and refusing to be intimidated. If you kill me, then you won't get any money. But if I live, you are assured my monthly payments. I've never missed one. Ask Lucky. Lucky folded his arms. I'm tired of seeing you every month. Do you know how much effort it is to collect your payments? You have five flights of stairs. It's exhausting, and I want out. Lucky, don't do this. It's Christmas, Christian pleaded. I'm a businessman. You'll have my money by the 20th or I'll leave my brother with you for a while. Unsupervised. So Christian was right, they were brothers. The knowledge that he'd pegged that one did little to make him feel better. They shut the door behind them with a bang that rattled the building all the way down to the foundation. Christian ran his hand around his throat, subconsciously checking to see if he was intact. He ran for his phone and clicked on the video to see exactly what Julia had pieced together. After everything they'd scripted, there was a shot of him spinning Samantha and that kiss. Watching it now made his arms ache to hold her. He would too. He'd hold on to every minute. Samantha's heart sank. She couldn't tell Mr. Takashiro that Joni was trying to back out. 
And what would she say to the My Heart channel viewers? Thanks for the opening your heart, but no thanks. She couldn't do that. There had to be an answer. Christian grabbed her hand and held on. He lowered his chin in humility. I had no idea we'd get this kind of response. Samantha forced her cheeks to lift. It's Christmas. Yeah, but not everyone feels the spirit of the season. Samantha tipped her head. She'd heard his words, but it was the resigned tone that gave her pause. What's going on? He lifted his chin off his chest, a practiced smile on his face. Nothing. We're good. Before Samantha could delve into that misty pool of uncertainty in Christian's gaze, Mr. Takashiro continued, We expect today will be one of our busiest yet. And you too will be popular. Don't let fame take you away from your duties, okay? Sell. 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 When this is all done, you'll need to take the jars to the bank for counting. Our liaison has offered to divide up the funds and issue cashier's checks for Mrs. Levitt to carry with her. We'll need a list of names from the base. Of course. Samantha wondered if they'd hand over that information or if she'd have to promise the army her firstborn son to get it. We'll do our best. Samantha hopped up, feeling light as a goose down pillow. Once they had the office door closed behind them, Christian drew her into his arms and buried his face in her neck. You smell good enough to eat. He rubbed his chin into her neck, making her giggle. She playfully slapped his arm without pushing him away. Stop it. We'll get caught. Don't care. Christian laid three warm kisses along her collarbone. She sighed. Me neither. He chuckled. What? I honestly thought I'd have to be a little more convincing. She lifted a shoulder. You're worth taking a risk for. Ah. He hugged her close. Aren't you sweet? She leaned into him. You're not going to think so after I tell you about the phone call I got from Joni. He pulled back but kept his hands laced together behind her as she explained about Joni's sudden fear of leaving the country with her young daughter in tow so she doesn't want to go. Christian asked in disbelief. I think she wants to, but she's scared. I'm going to look into finding her a guide or something. Christian nodded. K, let me know if there's anything I can do to help. I will. She kissed his cheek. Now let's get out there and meet these people who watch us on my heart channel. She laughed. I can't believe I just said that out loud. This whole thing is kind of surreal. I know what you mean. He pushed on the swinging door that led to the sales floor, and they headed to the women's department. Dozens of people milled about while another dozen actively looked through the clothing and jewelry. Samantha clocked in and then headed for the sweater display that had been rumpled. Aren't you that Santa woman? Asked a lady with a bright red coat and black leather purse. I am. Samantha grabbed a sweater to fold to hide the shaking in her hands. Is there something I can help you find? Oh my, yes. She took Samantha's forearm between her two hands. I need a dress for my husband's company party and I can't wait to tell everyone you helped me pick it out. Can I get a selfie to prove it? Samantha laughed. Let's find the dress and then we'll worry about the picture. The woman giggled. I'm putting the sleigh before the reindeer, aren't I? Samantha ushered her to the dress section and they picked several for her to try on. As she was hanging one of the not-so-perfect fit ones back up, another woman asked for help choosing a necklace to match a sweater set. Samantha went from one eager fan slash customer to another and was so busy she didn't have time to look for a guide for Joni. The weight of Joni wanting to pull out kept her from floating too high on the compliments viewers dished out. If Joni backed out, their whole reverse homecoming would fall down the chimney. She needed them to pull this off. Because, as she was quickly learning from excited customers, people were counting on this to make their Christmas, they were invested. She sent up a prayer that things would work out, and then did the only thing she could at the moment. Victor pulled his phone out with the speed of a quick-draw cowboy. He stepped away and was soon speaking in another language and gesturing with his hands. Julia watched him. She let out a schoolgirl sigh, which had Samantha pinching Christian's side again. She pressed her lips together, and Christian knew she was about to tease someone. Russian is such a romantic language, don't you think, Christian? She tipped her head towards Julia and did her best to repress the smile tugging at her lips. He grinned down at her. It's the most romantic language, if you ask me. Julia scowled at the two of them. Knock it off. They burst into laughter. Her indignation was a confession of sorts. Your children. She huffed and headed towards the perfume counter. We should start cleaning. Christian reluctantly let Samantha slip out of his arms. They went to the dress section first and almost had the display in order by the time Victor hung up the phone. He said he'll do it. Yes. Christian did a fist pump. Samantha's hands covered her mouth. Thank you. Thank your brother. Oleg, Victor reminded her. Thank Oleg. 
She threw her arms around Christian, kissed him soundly, and then jumped back out. I'm going to call Joni. She'll be so glad it's Victor's brother who will be there for her. With a squeal, she was dialing Joni's number. That was really cool of you. Christian clapped Victor on the back. My brother is a good man. He have Christmas in his heart. Victor made a fist and set it against his chest. Christian smiled and went back to hanging dresses. When he finished there, he started on the blouses. Samantha ran around in circles, picking things up as she talked to Joni. Her eyes were bright and beautiful, so animated with the joy of giving. Christian wanted to spend a lifetime with her. He wanted more time. While he couldn't be certain that Lucky would have him axed, he could end up not being able to walk or talk or type or provide for himself, let alone a family. He already sported a bent pinky from the last time he tried to tell Lucky no. The broken bone hadn't healed correctly because he hadn't gone to the doctor. He didn't have insurance at the time and had an EMT buddy splint it for him. And he'd been too scared to go to the police. He was so young, naive, really. His eyes fell on the coin jar. Just one jar and he could beg for some time. Time was all he wanted with Samantha. Life wasn't fair, giving him the perfect woman now. All it would take was one jar. Wasn't Samantha, wasn't love, worth it. It would be easy enough to pretend to combine two jars before taking them to the bank and stashing the other away. He took a picture of the jar and texted it to Lucky. I can't get all the money. Would this get me an extension? He held his breath as he waited for an answer. Bring the jar and we'll talk. He nodded his head while his stomach tied in knots. What choice did he have, really? He had to be here for and with Samantha. And he'd make the most out of every minute they had together. Chapter 20 The next morning, Samantha was headed to the bakery for a sweet shot of cinnamon roll to get the morning going when she bumped into Julia. Done. Julia held the door open while Samantha breezed through. What's done? Samantha removed her gloves and headed for the counter. She didn't have a lot of time before her shift started. If today was as busy as the rest of the week had been, she'd not get a moment off her feet. You wanted tears and open wallets. Julia leaned against the glass display case and checked the time on her phone. Countdown to posting. Five minutes. Samantha pointed to the largest cinnamon bun slathered in cream cheese frosting and asked the blue-haired clerk to heat it for her. He agreed, and she turned back to Julia. Is this the one with the company footage? Her fingers began to tingle. The sensation spread up her arms and coated her body. Yep. Julia blew on her fingernails and dusted them against her shoulder. It's true, this one almost made me cry. But did it make you want a kitten? Samantha joked. Julia's face turned red. Samantha grabbed her arm. Oh my gosh. You bought a kitten. Julia shook her off with a scowl. I bought it for Vic. Okay. Samantha bounced. That's the sweetest thing you could have ever done for him. Well, I'm not giving it to him until Christmas Eve and the stupid thing ripped apart my drapes last night, so he'd better appreciate it. Samantha squealed. He's going to totally melt. Her order came up, and she and Julia grabbed a booth. Samantha tapped the My Heart Channel app on her phone and closed out the Heart to Heart channel. She loved the relationship guru's advice, and now that she was in a relationship, she wanted all the advice she could get. It wasn't like her parents set a good example for her. Opening the Great Christmas Contest channel, she clicked on the latest video. The opening shot was of a large airplane and people milling about. They drew in on families hugging, lots of hugs and kisses could be seen. There was a shot of a little girl with wild hair, wearing footed pajamas holding a poster board as big as her. The poster read, Be safe. We'll miss you daddy. Samantha sucked in as if she'd been sucker punched by emotions so strong she couldn't hold them back. Her eyes stung and she had to blink several times to clear them so she could see the screen. A soldier in uniform squatted down in front of a three-year-old boy. Hey, buddy, I got you this bunny. He handed the kid the stuffed animal. Whenever you miss me, you hug that bunny and I'll feel it, okay? Samantha hit pause so she could wipe her eyes. You're killing me here. The regular bravado and confidence Julia wore like one of her black turtlenecks was gone. She swallowed thickly. These are the middle heartbreakers. I couldn't bring myself to put in the real hard goodbyes. There was one woman who was eight and a half months pregnant, and she was a mess. Her husband kissed her belly and whispered to his unborn child, I'll see you in six months. She brushed at her eyes. What these people give up, it's, it's made me soft, is what's it's done. Samantha laughed through her tears and put her hand on Julia's arm. Julia, I hope you know you have a gift. She glanced quickly away. It's harder when it touches my heart. But your heart is what makes this, she lifted her phone. 
so amazing. Victor saw your heart in your work long before the rest of us. Juliet chewed her lip. It scares me how easily he sees right through me. Samantha nodded. I can understand that. Just don't chase him away because you're scared. Julia's mouth dropped open. I bought the man a kitten and sacrificed my drapes to it. I don't plan to send him away anytime soon. Good. Samantha refocused on the video and hit play. The screen changed from the goodbyes to the company's arrival on base. Soldiers unpacked their olive green army issued bags. Commanders barked orders. Suddenly Corporal Levitt was on screen, his name written in block font across the bottom. He was setting up their engineering tent with a couple other soldiers. He made a face at the camera and then went back to work. The next shot was in the mess tent. The cameraman wasn't at all steady as he walked around the room. Guys were busy talking or on their phones. The camera stopped at a young man with red hair and freckles. What's your Christmas wish, Private Miller? Private Miller replied with a rogue grin. A girlfriend. The guys around him tossed bread at him or shoved his shoulder. Keep dreaming, came from somewhere off camera. Julia hit pause. I wanted to show some of their personality. These guys are heroes, but they're regular Joes too. Plus, if viewers were donating to the whole company, then I wanted them to put faces to their donations. It's perfect. Samantha hit play. She ignored her cinnamon roll, the one she'd asked to have warmed, because she was so enthralled with seeing the men they were working so hard for. The camera swung around and caught a guy with coal black hair and dreamy brown eyes. What's your wish, Private Thomas? Private Thomas stroked his jaw with his thumb as he thought. I wish I could taste my mama's roast. She makes the best dinners in the whole wide world. And I should know, I've been living halfway across it for six months. The men cheered at his answer and he didn't get any food thrown at him. They moved into the now fully functional engineer's tent. There were machines and computers everywhere with wires running up the walls and across the ceiling. I wanted to show you what we're working on when Corporal Levitt isn't around. The unidentified soldier winked at the camera and lifted a tarp, revealing the skeleton of a sleigh. Corporal Levitt works in here, and he has no idea Santa has a surprise for him this Christmas. But we let everyone else on base in on the secret. He made his way over to one of the computer terminals. As you can see, just because it's the holidays doesn't mean we get a break. This is Specialist Baker. Specialist Baker stood at attention. How are we coming on Santa's special assignment? Excellent, sir. The secret is wrapped up tight, barked Baker. The officer got closer to Baker's face and the camera zoomed in. You look a little smug, Baker. Yes, sir. Corporal Levitt was bragging about how pretty his wife is, sir. He's missing her something fierce. I can't wait to drop this bomb on him. Just so long as the sand sleigh is ready by her arrival. We want her to arrive in style. It will be, sir. We're dedicating our off hours to the project. We wouldn't mess this up, sir. The officer clapped him on the back and turned quickly, but not before the viewer had the chance to see the moisture shining in his eyes. The dewiness was a sharp contrast to the chiseled lines on his face and his sharp movements. The base faded away, and on the screen was a notice of how viewers could join with the soldiers in helping Santa complete his secret mission. Samantha used a paper napkin to wipe her cheeks. Julia's video stirred a desire in her to do more than she was doing and gave her the oomph to push through the day ahead. That was six, amazing. She laughed at herself. I won't be able to watch it without crying, ever. I'll bet Joni is an emotional mess. I'll have to call her. Julia put out her hand. I'll do it. What? I'll call her. I have some more footage she might like to see, and I'm putting together a montage for the families that she said she'd post to Facebook. Samantha stared at her. She waved her hand in front of Julia's face. Okay, who are you and what have you done with the woman who put a sticky note on Christian's face? Julia laughed as she gathered her feet beneath her. I'd do that again in a heartbeat. I've got to run. Thank you, Samantha called to her back. Julia waved from the door and was gone. She tapped her fingernail on the tabletop. That was one Christmas miracle she hadn't seen coming. His fear of Lucky disappeared. Lucky couldn't do anything that would take away his reward in heaven. If he was meant to meet God this Christmas, then he would be in the arms of his Savior and at peace. He slowly sat up, amazed at the lightness that practically floated him to his feet. With slow, measured movements, he replaced the lid on the package and shoved it back under the tree. Then, he picked up the real jar, not feeling the weight of it either, and made his way to the door. Grabbing the container he'd left on the counter, he pushed his way through the door and almost bumped into Samantha. Where've you been? Christian looked back at the break room door. 
The room wasn't anything stunning or particularly spiritual, and yet he'd had the most spiritual moment of his life in there. I was six. Mr. Takashiro opened the back door. You too, come on. The driver's getting antsy. Christian glanced over his shoulder one more time as he made his way to the parking lot. Samantha must have carried the other three containers out while he was deciding his salvation. He handed both jars up into the truck and stepped back, wrapping his arms around Samantha from behind. We'll meet you guys at the bank. The security company didn't allow them to ride in the truck, and Mr. Takashiro had offered to drive them over. The doors clanged shut, a final sound. Chapter 22 Samantha dragged Christian behind her, clutching the checks to her chest as they ran through the airport in search of Joni and Justice. They'd promised to wait outside of security to get the checks, and Samantha was late. The bank had awesome coin counting machines, but the bills had to be counted by hand, every one, one after the other, by bank employees, which meant she and Christian had to stand there and watch and couldn't do a darn thing to help. Whatever had taken Christian into the break room had brought about a new sense of calm in him. Great for him, he could wait with job. Samantha, on the other hand, tapped her foot, walked back and forth across the marbled floor, and almost tore her hair out, knowing that they still had to get to the airport to deliver the checks to Joni. While she was slightly curious about Christian's newfound peace, she didn't have time to spend having a heart-to-heart -heart right now. I think I see them. She wove through the holiday travelers with the skill of a woman who had grown up traversing New York sidewalks. Up ahead, Victor had his camera out and was filming their approach. Julia rubbed her palms together, no doubt loving the drama of almost missing the check delivery. Joni opened her arms and Samantha fell into them for a happy hug. This was it. This was the moment she had to let it all go and trust in God that her plan would work. She hugged tighter before letting Joni loose. Christian knelt down so he could be on Justice's level and fist bumped the little girl. Justice's hair was in pigtail braids and she had on a miniature backpack. Samantha ached to have a little girl of her own just as adorable as this one. A girl who had Christian's blue eyes and his impish smile. Christian had been weird about touching the checks, insisting she carry them. When she'd thrust half the stack his direction, he threw his hands up and backed away. It's your project. You take them. She'd been forced to find an alternative. I wrapped the checks in this ugly scarf. Samantha handed over the silk-wrapped package. The scarf was Santa red with elves in purple, blue, and green. She'd grabbed it off the coat rack at the bank after verifying that it had hung there for over a month and no one claimed it. The stack of checks barely fit in her hand. She hadn't dared put them in envelopes for fear she wouldn't be able to carry them. Joni tucked them into her purse and zipped it shut. She shifted her weight. I guess this is it. Oh. Julia threw her arms around Joni, who blinked in surprise. Merry Christmas, she said just loud enough that Samantha heard it. Merry Christmas. Joni patted her back. Victor was next. Joni disappeared inside his big arms. She laughed and Victor cried, tears as big as his heart falling to his shirt. For my brother. He handed her a small package. She nodded and added it to her purse. Christian stepped forward, hugging her briefly and then going back to entertaining justice. The little girl stared at him like he was a superhero. He didn't seem to mind the attention. Samantha forced out the breath she'd been holding. We'll be praying for you and for everyone on base. The guys had become familiar, many of them following her on social media. The Great Christmas Contest was the most popular channel on base, according to her contacts. Joni grinned and took Justice's hand. Thank you, Samantha. I'm so excited I could burst and Christmas confetti would sprinkle all over you guys. They all laughed and then several of them sniffed. Thank you, Joni, for being brave. You made my Christmas. Samantha meant every word. Joni had given her a purpose. Something bigger than her own problems. In making someone else's Christmas wish come true, she'd had the best Christmas of her life. They all said goodbye, and Joni took justice to the security checkpoint. Christian slipped his arm around Samantha's back and she rested her head on his chest as they watched the pair head off on a holiday they would never forget. A loud sob broke out and Julia buried her face in Victor's neck. Shocked at first, Victor didn't respond quickly. But when he did, his movements were gentle. I'm sorry, Julia gasped. I've been holding this in for weeks and I just, she pantomimed a bomb going off. It's okay. Victor ran his hand down the back of her head. You are a strong woman. You have strong emotions. Oh, shut up. She smacked his chest and then threw her arms around his neck. With determination, she kissed him. 
Victor smiled so wide, it broke the kiss, but Julia kept her focus. Samantha glanced at Christian. As if their minds were in sync, they took one giant step backwards and then another before turning around and melting into the crowd. It wasn't like the new couple had much privacy, but at least they didn't have people they knew staring at them. Christian took her hand. Do you think the bakery is still open? They have extended holiday hours. Perfect. There's something I need to tell you. Samantha let out a contented sigh. It was the kind of sigh that came from a job well done and knowing that your future is worth looking forward to. With Christian by her side, she was more than content, she was full of possibilities. Nothing could compare to this moment, not even Christmas morning. She may not even come off this high until after the new year. Chapter 23 Christian took a sip of his cocoa, letting the warm liquid soothe his throat. He'd been talking for over a half hour, explaining about his dad's addiction, dropping out of school, lucky, and the choice he'd made in the break room. Putting all that into words was more difficult than he'd expected, but it also freed him in a way he hadn't anticipated. Throughout his long story, Samantha had sat frozen in her seat, steam rising from her cocoa mug and the chocolate cake growing stale in the forced air heating. So he's out there. She pointed to the dark window, where they could hardly see the people passing close by, let alone anyone five feet away. Snow swirled about, tiny flakes that bit at your nose. Looking for you. Probably. There was no probably about it, but he didn't want to frighten her. He knows where you live. He does. Then you can't go home. He lifted a shoulder. I'll need to eventually. I can't avoid him forever. But that's not fair. He's changed the rules. He can't do that. Christian took her ice-cold hands in his. It's okay, Samantha. She threw his hands off of hers. No. It's not. You don't get it. I'm in love with you, Christian, and I'm not going to lose you. Sam, there's nothing we can do. I'm at his mercy, and he has none. She picked up his hand and traced her fingers along his bent pinky. I'm just sick. I thought you got this as a kid falling off your bike or something. She shuddered even though she was the one tracing her fingers across his skin. You should be a doctor. They fell silent, each one contemplating the tabletop. Come home with me, just for tonight. I can't let you go alone. We need more time to figure this out. The longer I make him wait, the worse it will be. Samantha slammed her hands on the table. Dang it, you're a stubborn fool. She slung her purse over her shoulder and took off out the door. Samantha walked fast and the snow stung her eyes and her cheeks. The tears came hot and fast before falling cold to her jacket. How could Christian be so cavalier about her feelings? Thrusting them aside like day old donuts, she rubbed her forehead. So many things made sense that her head spun as it threw pieces of the puzzle into place. Christian's low-key lifestyle, the way he lived like he was afraid to enjoy life. Well, he'd done that up until the contest started. No, it was when they joined forces that he really came alive. She should call the police. She should, despite Christian's warning not to. He said it would only make Lucky mad and that Lucky would get to him long before the police had a chance to look into the case. He was so calm about the whole thing it made her want to spit nails. Her legs chewed up the sidewalk. She bumped into a man and he grabbed her upper arms to steady her. Sorry, she mumbled. When she tried to go around him, he didn't let her go. Looking up, she found herself in Lucky's arms. Her heart stuttered to a stop and her voice caught in a web of fear in her throat. Hello, pretty lady. He stroked his hand down her brown hair. You're going in the wrong direction. I. S.H. 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 He put a finger over her lips. She jerked her head away. No one was going to touch her lips. No one but Christian. She narrowed her eyes, ready to spit in his face if he thought kissing her was a good idea. Let's take a walk, pretty lady. Fear locked her knees as she recognized the man she'd thought was Christian's landlord. She shook her head. Lucky jerked her around and her legs figured out what they were doing. Walking brought blood to her brain again and she felt for her phone in her pocket with her free hand. Lucky kept the other in a vice so tight her fingers started to tingle. She found the button that turned on the camera and hit it twice. As casually as she could, she pulled it from her pocket and glanced down to press the record button. I don't want to go with you, Lucky. She hadn't meant to sound so frightened, but she was truly afraid. And if she established that she was being kidnapped, then the police would come after her six, wouldn't they? Too bad. I need an incentive for your friend. What friend? She needed names and places and all the information he could give her. The light changed and they were forced to wait for traffic. Christian stiffed me and I'm going to make sure he doesn't do it again. The light changed and he tugged heavily on her arm. 
you wanted him to steal for you, I want my money, she yanked back on her arm, hoping to loosen his hold enough that she could slip away, all she got for her efforts was a sore shoulder, it wasn't his debt to pay, you do for family, just cause his father died doesn't mean I can let the money go, if I did that, people would be dying all over the city, it's their love for their family that keeps them paying, you're despicable, she dug her heels into a crack in the sidewalk, Lucky laughed, I've been called worse, he pulled her forward with hardly any effort on his part, her shoes scraped along as Lucky didn't even slow down, Samantha's ears began to ring, I'll bet you have, she glanced around, there were still people on the street, let go of me, she yelled at the top of her lungs, hey, you all right, a guy called to her, he was weaving closer, Samantha's heart leapt with hope, Lucky leaned closer, either you come with me or I send Christian to spend some quality time with his father, a trickle of sweat ran down Samantha's back, hot and cold at the same time, the hard glint of silver in Lucky's eyes witnessed to his determination to follow through on his threat, he let go of her arm, daring her to run, hey, are you okay, the stranger took her free hand, the one with the phone, so far, Lucky hadn't seen it, or, if he had, he didn't think about it, she yanked herself away from him, I'm fine, why do you ask, she smiled, her face feeling like it was splintering as she did so, he looked back and forth between the two of them, it sounded like you were in trouble, nope, I'm good, thank you, though, that was very nice of you, she had to push the words out and she prayed he would go away, his smile bloomed, okay, then, have a nice night, you too, said Lucky with a lift of his chin, Samantha dropped her chin to her chest, you don't have to yank on me anymore, I'll go so you won't have to kill Christian, Lucky nodded and started off, he was a step and a half ahead of her, which gave her the opportunity to send the video to Victor, she'd thought about sending it to Christian, but all that would do would send him running after her, and then Lucky would have everything he needed to hurt them, what she needed was time, she prayed Victor's phone was on, she prayed he'd know what to do, and she prayed that somehow, she and Christian would get out of this alive. Chapter 24 Christian dragged himself up the stairs to his apartment. He was calm, but he wasn't in a hurry to take a beating or be thrown in a dumpster never to be heard from again. What would happen to Mrs. Knapp? Who would change her light bulbs? He fingered her doorknob on his way down the hall. She'd had a cold and been laid up for several days. He'd taken her chicken soup from the deli down the street yesterday. It was strange to think that he may never get the chance to ask her if she enjoyed it. His door loomed, and Lucky was nowhere in sight. He should put on some Christmas music and a kettle and just plan on staying awake tonight. It wasn't like he'd sleep well even if he tried. Samantha had every right to be mad at him. He went and fell in love with her when he should have known better. The last week was the best week of his life, and if he lived twelve hours or twelve years, he'd hold on to the feel of her in his arms. She was his happy place, and he hated that her last words to him were said in anger. His key turned too easily in the lock. He pushed the door open and stayed in the hallway, peering in. The blinds were open, letting the yellow streetlight into the room. There was an odd-shaped lump on his couch. Like a cornered stray in the alley, he felt brave enough to face his foe head-on. Evening, Lucky, we need to talk. He flipped on the lights, and the sight of Samantha sitting next to Lucky on his chapped leather sofa made his heart fall to the floor. It bounced across the worn carpet and landed at Samantha's feet. He cursed. Hi. She lifted her hand in a small wave. Protectiveness roared in his chest. He motioned for her to come to him. She made to rise, and Lucky slammed his hand down on her knee. I think you should stay right here. Christian marched into the room and landed toe-to-toe -to -toe with Lucky. His shiny dress shoes in sharp contrast to the large work boots Lucky clumped around in. Let. Her. Go. Lucky chuckled. You don't have a say here. I have every say here. She's innocent in all this. If you want me, he pounded his chest. Then let's go. His voice rose until he was yelling. His only hope was that, with the door open, someone on his floor would call the cops. Although he would probably be much worse off when they got here. He didn't care, though, saving Samantha was what was important. Lucky slowly got to his feet. His huge fists swung like rocks. Christian stepped back, putting distance between them. He motioned for Samantha to make a run for it. Get out of here, Sam. She shook her head. I can't leave you here. Lucky laughed. What a pair. You know, it's a good thing she's here, because if you don't make it through the night, then she'll have to pick up your payments. Christian roared and slammed his fist into Lucky's nose. He heard something squish and felt a pop beneath his knuckles. 
the triumph didn't last long as his hand screamed in pain. He glanced down to see blood oozing from a cut and his middle finger cocked in a crazy position. He'd broken his hand on Lucky's face. He looked up. Lucky's nose was bleeding. While that was satisfying, Christian didn't think he could throw another punch. Lucky raised his fist, his eyes hard. Samantha jumped, grabbing his elbow. I've got video of you kidnapping me. If you hit him, you'll be charged with battery too, that's federal prison. Lucky dropped his arm so suddenly that Samantha landed on the floor in a heap. He kicked her hip. What are you talking about? She scrambled back, climbing up the couch like a crab. I videoed you kidnapping me and sent it to my cameraman. He'll upload it to my heart channel any second now. She glanced at Christian, and he saw the hollow spot behind her threat. She was bluffing, but it was a darn good bluff and he'd run with it. You've been extorting Christian for years. You should be in jail for that alone. She slowly got to her feet. But if you lay one finger on him, I'll make sure you spend the rest of your life behind bars. Lucky looked back and forth between the two of them. You can't testify if you're dead. Then you'll rot in jail for murder. He lifted a shoulder. They'll have to catch me first. He lunged for Christian with surprising speed, catching him around the neck. Samantha screamed. Run, Sam. Christian forced the words through his restricted windpipe. Samantha screamed again. She pounded on Lucky's shoulder, who squeezed harder in response. The edges of Christian's vision darkened. There was pressure in his face and behind his eyes as he clawed at Lucky's hands. Something hit Lucky in the head and grazed off Christian's crown. He didn't even feel it hit, only noticed the pieces of glass sprinkling down like fallen Christmas stars. Christmas. It was Christmas. As the darkness closed in, he felt warm all over, the pressure released, and all there was was peace. He floated in the darkness. Samantha watched Christian go slack and slither to the floor. Her heart screamed, but her mouth couldn't make a sound. Lucky checked his forehead, where a large piece of glass stuck out. Blood gushed down his face. Christian coughed and wheezed. He was alive. She could have kissed him if she wasn't facing off with a man who wished her dead. Lucky's arms waved above his head, and she had the oddest mental association with the abominable snowman in the old Rudolph movie who had a toothache. She stared in horror at what she'd done. The picture frame was the only thing on the side table, and she'd smashed it over Lucky's head when her fists didn't have the desired effect. Blood trailed down his face and pooled on his shirt. Lucky took a step toward her and she took a step back. Hands in the air. Barked a cop as he ran into the room, wearing a plastic face guard and with his gun drawn. Right behind him came three more police officers, each armed. Lucky looked around, his eyes wide, trying to find an escape. You can always jump out the window. Samantha glared at him. He lunged for her, but she jumped onto the bed to get out of his reach. One of the cops shot his taser and the next thing she knew, Lucky was convulsing on the floor. It was an awful sight with all the blood on his face and drool foaming around his mouth. She scrambled over the bed and made her way to Christian, who blinked. He lightly touched his throat. Don't talk, she told him. With much effort, she and an officer managed to scoot him out of the way while Lucky was escorted out the door. She sat behind Christian, her back to the wall and his torso lying against her. His head leaned back on her shoulder and she ran her fingers through his hair in an effort to comfort him. Don't talk, okay. She kissed his temple. The police will call an ambulance for you. It's going to be all right. She kissed him again, unable to stop from touching him to make sure he was still here, that he was in her arms and breathing. She splayed her hands across his chest. He was breathing, but his body was tense with pain. An officer squatted in front of the two of them. Miss Noel. Samantha nodded. We need to get a statement, and I have to confiscate your phone with the video. She nodded and handed over her phone. It's all on there. His radio crackled. Copy that. He looked at Christian. Paramedics are on their way. Christian nodded. He reached an arm up and back, cupping the back of Samantha's head and bringing her ear to his cheek. Love you, he whispered. The sound was hollow and raspy, but the words brought tears to her eyes. I love you too. Sorry, but Victor and I have work to do. Julia busied herself taking down cameras. Victor wiped his cheeks off with a sheepish smile. I will call other taxi. Christian and Samantha helped Mrs. Knapp to her feet and back to the cab. It's a good thing we have the late shift, Samantha laughed. I could use a nap. She leaned her head back on his shoulder. Tomorrow's the meeting. They'd have to meet and discuss the results of the great Christmas contest with the other contestants, and they'd learn who would become the new owner of French hens. I haven't checked the hearts on anybody's videos in over a week. She yawned. I wonder who will win. He shrugged. 
It didn't matter anymore. He tipped her chin up so he could see into her lustrous brown eyes. I won. He pressed his lips to hers, and this time... Chapter 26 Late in the day on December 23rd, the contestants of the Great Christmas Contest sat around the table. None of them made eye contact, except Samantha and Christian, who could hardly keep their eyes off each other. For Samantha, the meeting was a formality, a chance to congratulate the winner before going back to her life, her not-so-normal life. In her normal life, she didn't meet with the police on a daily basis, didn't sign autographs, and didn't cuddle up with Christian to watch movies. The video of Mrs. Knapp released the day before and had gone viral. A headstone for Christmas wasn't a normal gift, but it had touched the hearts of America, perhaps because people wanted to believe that kind of love is out there. For Samantha, that kind of love was sitting next to her. Christian leaned over. Did Joni text? She couldn't hold back her grin. They're sleeping a lot today, jet lag. He nodded and then went quiet again. Next to Christian was Chloe. Her black hair curled beautifully and gathered to one side of her face. With a quiet sweep of her hand, she brushed her fingers over her necklace. Miller was next to her at the foot of the table. A trickle of sweat ran down the side of his face. He didn't clear it off, almost as if he were thinking so hard he didn't notice it was there. Across from them, a woman checked the time on her phone. She tapped her long, fake nails on the wood with a click-click-clack sound, over and over again. Just when Samantha thought the silence would suffocate them all, Mrs. Woolbridge swept into the room, followed by no less than three lawyers and her trusty store manager, Mr. Takashiro. All right. She clapped her hands together as if gathering the attention of a schoolroom full of children. She didn't need to, they were all silently waiting. Only Samantha and Christian sat back in their chairs, relaxed. They'd talked at length about what they wanted to do after the contest. Christian wanted to go back to school. He didn't know if he'd make it all the way to being a doctor, but he wanted to try. If he made a physician's assistant, then he was okay with that. It was far beyond what he'd thought was possible with Lucky breathing down his neck. Samantha had taken more time to think things over. She liked her job at Three French Hens and wasn't keen on leaving. They had good benefits and she had some flexibility over her schedule. The pay wasn't great, but she'd be up for a raise in five months and that would help. Mostly, she liked knowing she would be there for Christmas next year. Let me just say that this project has been a bigger success than I dreamed. Mrs. Woolbridge grinned as if she were personally responsible for the goodwill that had spread from French hens into the community. The New York Times reported that morning that charitable donations were up 20%, and sidewalk Santas had their buckets filled twice as often as they had the year before. Samantha cocked her head. In a way, Mrs. Woolbridge was responsible. If she hadn't cooked up this crazy scheme, then none of them would have taken to the streets or given as much of their time to others. Samantha wouldn't have. For that reason, she was thankful she'd been chosen as one of the contestants. The lawyers, she flicked her hands at the suits lined up by the door. Have compiled the lists, and I've personally reviewed each of your videos. She paused, and her woman in charge facade melted away. I was truly touched. Thank you for making this a meaningful experience for myself and the people you donated to. She met each of their gazes, nodding her thanks. Okay, let's make this as painless as possible. Miller, you are now the owner of three French hens. She lifted her hands and clapped. Their competitor leaned forward, spreading her fingers out wide on the tabletop. Hold up him. These two had five times as many hearts. She pointed at Samantha. Before Samantha could wave off her protest, Mrs. Woolbridge said, yes. She smiled fondly at the two of them. But I've made my decision. So the contest was a fake. Not at all. I needed to know that the person I selected was dedicated to three French hens, willing to take on an enormous job, and well-connected in the community. Miller demonstrated all three characteristics throughout the project. She stepped away from the table, ending all other protests. Miller, Samantha, and Christian, I'd like to meet with you in my office. Samantha and Christian jumped up. They filed into the executive office, and Mrs. Woolbridge wasted no time. Here's the key to the building. She handed Miller a golden key. Samantha wondered if that really was the key or if it was a prop. For a prop, it was impressive. Now, until we sign those papers, I'm still the owner of three French hens, and I am going to start a new program. The Giving Tree is wonderful, but I'd like to do something like what Samantha did this year. She paused and put her hand on Samantha's arm. I can't wait for the video on Christmas Day, dear. Is everything all set? 
Samantha nodded. I don't know who is more excited, Joni or the troops. Or me. Mrs. Woolbridge released her arm and gave her a critical eye. Do you think you could pull this off again next year? Samantha's heart jumped up and down. She immediately pictured another reverse homecoming, with a whole new group of soldiers. Her mind spun with ideas. Three French hens customers had come through to send love to troops overseas, and she knew they would again. With twelve months to plan it out. Piece of cake. Good. I'm promoting you to head of Christmas giving. Samantha stumbled into Christian, who wrapped his arms around her. Seriously. Seriously. Mrs. Woolbridge turned to Christian. Now, what am I going to do with you? He laughed. Even though he was healing well and had spoken more today than the day before, the sound of his laughter eased many of her worries. Not a thing. I'm headed back to school, he announced proudly. Ah, that I can help with. My grandfather started a private scholarship program. Since I'm retired, the board has talked me into taking a more active role in management. I'll send you a link to apply. She winked. Are you Santa Claus? Christian joked. He stuck his hand out and they shook hands on the deal, Mrs. Woolbridge giggling. I feel like Santa today. She turned on her heel. Off with you too. I have an hour to train my replacement, and then I'm off to a holiday party. Miller paled and tugged on his tie. Samantha quick-stepped in her high heels. Christian loved her shoes. She'd caught him looking at her legs several times today. They shared a heated, happy kiss in the elevator. Just as the doors opened, Samantha blurted, Will you come to Christmas dinner at my house? She was so nervous about introducing Christian to her dad, but when she'd thought Lucky was going to erase her, she'd realized how much her father would miss her. He really did love her. Even if he was unconventional, the love was real. Sure, can I bring anything? A ring. She almost laughed out loud at the thought. Just bring you. He kissed her quickly. The noise from the sales floor reached them as they stepped off the elevator. I'll be there. They made their way to the women's department and hardly had time to steal a kiss for the next three days as they helped make Christmas special for holiday shoppers. Chapter 27 Christian took off his gloves when he was a block away from Samantha's house. His hands were too warm from nerves, even though his breath hovered in the air like a balloon. The temperature had dropped and so had the snow. It was a white Christmas, the city the picture of a New York holiday. He knocked on the door to Samantha's brownstone and stepped back, his head spinning. He rubbed his neck. The bruises were still there and he couldn't bear to wrap up in a scarf. The feeling of the cloth wrapping around him had him gasping for air, and he'd thrown the thing on the floor before charging out the door. The door swung open and Samantha launched herself into his arms. The clean scent of her hair and the warmth of her body against his erased the darkness of his thoughts. He crushed her against him, feeling as if it had been weeks instead of hours since they'd last seen one another. I missed you. I missed you too. Come on, it's freezing out here. She took his hand and led him inside. You can take your shoes off here. She pointed to a small bench in the entrance. He tracked in a snowball's worth of snow and was more than happy to get his feet out of the cold leather. The wood floors were warm thanks to the ancient radiators along the base of the walls. They made their way into the kitchen, where a stunning woman was stirring gravy and an older gentleman carved the turkey. Samantha put her arm around Christian's back, her limb trembling. Dad, Yvette, I'd like you to meet Christian. Yvette threw her arms wide and hugged him as if he were her long-lost brother. You made it. Yeah. Was there any doubt? Dad shook his hand. His grip was strong, but he leaned away, evaluating Christian with a critical eye. You're the guy who attacked Lucky for my little girl, huh? He looked Christian over as if he were an undersized steak. Sure, he'd come up short in the fight, but it was a fight he'd known he wouldn't win, and he'd fought it anyway, for Samantha. I did. She's worth it. His answer seemed to pacify her dad's sense of protectiveness. Hey, the link is live, called Yvette. They all crowded around Yvette as she held out an iPad. She pressed play. The Great Christmas Contest logo hovered on screen, and then Joni and Justice's smiling faces appeared. Merry Christmas. They called. Scenes of them at the airport hugging Samantha and Christian goodbye played. Then one of Joni carrying a sleeping Justice off the plane, driving through the small town by the base. Shopping. Joni reading the night before Christmas to Justice in the hotel room, the two of them snuggled up on the bed. We can see Daddy tomorrow. Justice asked. Joni's smile could have lit the Empire State Building. Yes. Tomorrow. Good. She snuggled into the covers. The image switched to the army base. Guys in camo painted the sleigh red that they'd shown half done in the last video. They rigged it up to a four-wheeler to the front and gave it a test run. 
snickering, someone filmed Corporal Levitt sleeping in his bunk, completely unaware that his Christmas was about to be flipped on its side. And then an unnamed soldier whispered, he has no idea. The men grinned and tiptoed ridiculously out of the barracks, shutting the door quietly behind them with their finger pressed over their lips. Samantha grabbed onto Christian's hand and squeezed. I'm so excited. I know this already happened, but I think I'm going to burst. Neither of them had heard from Joni except a text that said she'd call when she was back in town. The camera panned a street between the mess hall and command tents. The troops were packed in tight, like candy canes. They were all smiling, the thrill of being part of a surprise unmistakable on their faces. At the top of the street was a small stage. The camera zoomed in on Corporal Levitt on the front row. The commanding officer went to the mic and wished everyone a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, sir, thundered through the iPad speakers. He talked for a minute about Christmas and then said he had a special recognition for Corporal Levitt that he wanted to present. Corporal Levitt made his way up the steps with measured cadence. Christian wanted to yell at him to run. If he only knew what was about to happen, that he would hold his wife and daughter in his arms six. The commander grinned wide. I was going to present this, but I think we'll let Santa do the honors. He pointed down the street, and the camera angle changed. On the four-wheeler was a man dressed in a Santa suit. He called ho 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 as the soldiers parted to let him through. When the sleigh was close enough that Corporal Levitt could see past Santa's padding, he jumped from the stage and charged towards his family in the sleigh. Justice yelled, Daddy, and wrapped her arms around his neck and didn't let go. Joni lost it, crying heavily into his shoulder. Corporal Levitt climbed right on top of them in the sleigh, laughing, hugging and kissing them over and over again. He kept asking, How? How are you here? Joni sucked in a breath, swallowed her emotion, and said, We got a Christmas wish. Corporal Levitt kissed her and kissed her and kissed her. Behind them, hardened soldiers wiped their eyes and sniffled like children. Santa pulled the sleigh forward and encouraged them all to climb up on stage. Joni had a small red sack over her shoulder. Quite the step up from the ugly scarf Samantha grabbed at the bank. Oleg must have gotten that for her, said Samantha. Christian agreed. Joni shook hands with the commanding officer and they exchanged a few words. Corporal Levitt had one arm around her and Justice in the other. She stepped up to the microphone. Laughed in pure joy, she said, thank you. She blew them all a kiss, and they erupted in applause. Corporal Levitt asked, they knew. Joni nodded. Everyone knew. The camera jumped to his company and they were pointing and smiling and smacking one another on the back for a job well done. Joni took a deep breath, and for the moment, her tears dried up. Thank you all for welcoming us on base today. I feel like it's a miracle being here. She glanced down. I brought you all a present. The troops hooted and hollered. Thanks to three French hens in New York, who made it possible for me to be here today, and the great Christmas contest, I've come with donations from their customers to each of you to say thank you for your service and sacrifice. God bless. She held up the sack, and everyone clapped. The scene changed to Joni calling names and handing out checks. Then they were getting individual soldiers' reactions. One guy with lines down his face and pale blue eyes had a hard time controlling his emotions. My baby is going off to college this year. We needed this. He held up the check. Another woman sobbed. My husband is struggling back home. Our car broke down. We have two kids. A young man who couldn't have been older than 20 held up the check. I'm sending this to my mama. She sacrificed so much for me growing up. The final image was of the whole base, with Corporal Levitt, Joni, and Justice in front, waving goodbye. Merry Christmas. Samantha swiped at her cheeks. I think my tear ducts are completely empty. Yvette patted her arm. Mine too. Christian had been so nervous on the way over, but all that went away as he watched the video. Samantha had done that, she'd made Christmas special for over 300 people in Poland. He'd never find a better woman. He took a step back and went down on one knee. Samantha gasped. Yvette stepped in front of Dad and grabbed both his arms, wrapping them around her. Christian reached into his shirt pocket and pulled out the engagement ring. It was a sprig of holly made from emeralds and rubies. He had put a fancier diamond set on layaway and would have it by Easter. Samantha Noel, you are everything that's wonderful about Christmas. Working beside you the last few years has been my source of light, and loving you these last few weeks has been my joy. Will you marry me? Yes. She clasped his cheeks and kissed him. He felt her tears on his face and pulled back. I thought your tear ducts were empty. He teased. I guess happy tears never run out. He put his forehead to hers. 
not with us. She smiled, and he couldn't help but kiss her again. You are my Christmas miracle, Samantha. And you're mine. Come on, you too, called Yvette. Let's eat before it gets cold. They sat down to Christmas dinner, and Christian had never felt more blessed. The turkey and stuffing were delicious, but most of all, his vision of dancing with Samantha in front of the Christmas tree had become his reality. That, above all else, was his greatest Christmas wish, and he'd make it every year until their love became bigger than eternity. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the great Christmas contest, please leave a comment below and tell your friends about this audiobook. For more holiday romance, subscribe to my channel. If you're looking for an ad-free listening experience, follow me on Patreon. I'll put the link in the description below. And, if you want more of my books, check out my author page on Amazon or look for Lucy McConnell wherever books are sold. I hope you have a very Merry Christmas.